Good morning. We hope we find you and your families well and safe. The Polytech Institute of Bragança and the Mountain Research Center welcome you to the first natural product application, health, cosmetic, and food online conference. The Mountain Research Center is one of the five research centers within the Polytech Institute of Bragança and is an R&D unit of excellence. CIMU conducts research on the Mediterranean mountain system following following an interdisciplinary strategy that goes from nat nature to products. In all these years, we have had the commitment of disseminating science around the world, creating solid and robust bounds and partnerships with both academy and industry. And we are always looking for more challenging collaborations. In this sense, the Mountain Research Center gathers different ways to keep involving in our mission uh, science dissemination, especially now during this difficult pandemic situation in which science dissemination has been extremely affected. Therefore, one of our responses was the creation of this first edition of the Natural Product Application Online Congress, which consists in, dissemination, in the dissemination of research using natural products applied in three different areas, cosmetic, food, and health. At this point, the NPA team and myself, Lillian Barrows, Vice Coordinator of the Mountain Research Center, would like to thank you all for participating in this exciting project, which in less than one month has received more than 450 registrations from universities to important companies from different parts of the world, such as Algeria, Argentina, Brazil, France, Greece, Italy, Mexico, Netherlands, Poland, Russia, Serbia, Slovenia, Spain, Ukraine, and the US. The NPA Congress received and processed more than 200 communications from which the scientific committee has selected the most appropriate for each type of communication, considering the limited time we have for the conference. All the submitted works were divided into three main categories, oral, pitch, and poster communications, which, we will, which will join also the nine keynote lectures and one invited oral communication, to which we would like to thank their availability and for accepting this invitation. Finally, before leaving you with Professor Orlando Rodrigues, the president of the Institute Polytech of Bragança, the NPA team would also like to thank our special guest speaker for the opening ceremony, Professor Isabel Ferreira, Secretary of State of Inland Improvement of the Portuguese government. Professor Isabel Ferreira does not need any introduction due to her vast experience in food technology and natural products application, which she has been recognized for seven consecutive years as a highly cited researcher by Clarivate, due to her more than 700 published research articles. She was also coordinator of several national and international research projects, has several national and international patents, and was supervisor of tens of postdocs, PhDs, and BA students. She has also been editor of many well-recognized scientific journals and is also the former vice president of IPB and coordinator of the Mountain Research Center. Thank you, Professor Isabel Ferreira, for being part of this opening session, which I know this also is a real a, a, a thematic within your great expertise when you were a, a researcher. Once again, we would like to thank you all for attending this first online edition of our Congress. And we will now leave you with the president of IPB, uh, Professor Orlando Rodrigues, which we, I would also like to thank for accepting this invitation to be part of our opening session. Professor Orlando Rodrigues, as we normally would say, the floor is yours. Uh, but in this case, this screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, much Lillian. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to this uh, online uh, uh, participative congress. Just a word to thank you, all of you, to 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 be engaged in on that initiative. 
And um, a very special thanks to, to Isabel Ferreira, our Secretary of State um, uh, for the, the interior cohesion. Um, <clears throat> And thank you very much, all of you, for organizing this, uh, this uh, uh, so important uh, meeting. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, that uh, you uh, continue working in uh, cooperation all over the world and in the field so important in our, in nowadays in our societies. Um, indeed, you are in the center of, uh, of uh, um, some very important priorities uh, of, of, for our societies all over the world, not just in, um, uh, in Europe or in some regions of the world, in, the, in all over the world. Um, the sustainability uh, of uh, the, the way we do our industry, uh, our uh, food production, uh, it's 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 very important nowadays. We, we, we and your research is 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 in the center of that. Um, we need we need to take more value from um, agriculture and and, and natural products. Uh, we need to do the the production of um, uh, of of food and. Uh, um, and in general, uh, industry production in a more sustainable uh, way. Um, there are a lot of changes that are now uh, uh, in, in, in our industry, in our production, and uh, really your, your research is, is in the center of, of the most important things that we should do um, in these days. So, um, uh, thank you very much for doing what you do. Uh, thank you very much for cooperation. It's very important that the researchers, researchers are probably the people that more uh, cooperate uh, between countries all over the world. It's very important that you continue doing that. Of course, it will be very important that you, you that we can uh, um, uh, do this, this kind of, of, uh, of sessions presentially. But it, it is also very important that we uh, take profit from that, uh, from that way of, uh, of working and be in, in contact uh, with each other. And in the future, we do more contacts, more cooperation in these digital ways. So thank you very much for being uh, engaged and uh, a lot of, of success for your initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Orlando, for your kind words. Um, and now I uh, will share the screen with the Professor Isabel Ferreira. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to present my regards to the president of the IPB and uh, to the organizing committee and also the, the scientific committee of this very, very, very well participated meeting and um, particularly in the person of Dr. Lilian Barros, um, which is the leader of an excellent and brilliant team uh, that works on, this, on these topics of natural products. So I am very proud to be here and share uh, the screen with all of you. And the research uh, on natural products has been receiving huge attention in the last decades. And plants, mushrooms, and algae contain, as we all know, a wide diversity of bioactive compounds that may play an essential role in the development of health, cosmetic, or fruit products, which is the, the topic of this meeting. In what concerns food products, there's an overall debate uh, regarding the safety aspects, uh, namely of artificial preservatives added widely in many food formulations to prevent the multiplication of, of spoilage and pathogenic microbes. This is uh, obviously an arguable issue uh, since all additives employed in food products are priorly subjected to a strict evaluation and validation process conducted by entities such as Food and Drug Administration in the US, 
but also European Food Safety Authority in in European Union. Therefore, their their safety should be considered as indisputable. Nonetheless, as we all know, there are several reports and mostly scientific reports highlighting particularly deleterious effects evaluated in artificial compounds, such as carcinogenic or ter uh, teratogenic attributes or, or some residual toxicity. This ends up, of course, setting pavement and intensive research oriented towards finding natural surrogates to replace the artificial or synthetic compounds that that uh, are usually associated to those adverse effects. Likewise, to prevent the, the aforementioned problems, consumers and authorities have been stressing out the need uh, to substitute these artificial additives with alternative, effective and known toxic substances and natural products could be an alternative. When added into a determined product, these natural agents might be employed to protect, uh, but also to enrich the product itself to benefit the physiological state of the consumer. For example, uh, natural antioxidants uh, are well knowledge for their wide range of biological and inclusively pharmacological activities. Therefore, representing several beneficial effects in nutrition and also in health. And for these antioxidants contribute to increase the shelf life of a wide diversity of products as they prevent the oxidation of several key compounds, which if oxidized would seriously compromise the, the, the product quality. Other agents such as, for instance, antimicrobial compounds are added to protect the product for unwanted microbial, microbial based spoilage process. But when employed in food products, they should not exert any physiological uh, antimicrobial activity. Independently of the targeted purpose, if we plan to extend the applicability of natural substances in health, cosmetic, or food related products, it is mandatory to increase our knowledge on these versatile natural additives. In any given study, it will always be essential to perform uh, molecular structure elucidation analysis, uh, clarify the molecular cell mechanisms through which microorganisms respond against natural bioactive compounds, to elucidate all potential structure activity relationships, to comprehend different matrix effects on the efficiency of biological activity in combination with other hurdles, uh, use emerging technologies like microencapsulation techniques or others to increase the biological activity of different natural agents and also to understand consumers' acceptability and their quality perception. And as I previously mentioned, uh, intensive research has been conducted to identify and characterize this nearly endless diversity of biological compounds. This through work has originated an immense library of compounds and big data on their associated bioactivities. However, there is a lot to be done in the scientific community industry interface. The Portuguese government is eagerly committed to strengthen the collaborative work among these two key actors, as clearly exemplified by uh, collaborative laboratories, but also research centers, as the Mountain Research Center, which has an extensive work with companies uh, and with the industrial sector um, and uh, the, the, the intensive activity in co-promotion projects. And for that, the government will continue to fortify the diversification and differentiation of experts, ecosystems, technological centers, ID institutions and industry aiming to capacitate the introduction 
of novel processes and products, able to reach market success and to impact the economies of the territories. This integrated approach is entirely displayed in the next mobilizing agenda, whose expected promotion of technological transformation will be supported by the national clusters with highest potential in specific scientific sectors as identified in our program, Spandir, the program of expansion national wide projects for interior development. This, this was uh, recently approved through the minister, through a minister cancer resolution. Uh, and in what concerns uh, to these matters, to the agro food sector, we have clusters related also with the development of natural based health, cosmetic and food products. And uh, they, they, they are located uh, all over the country in different cities, including, including uh, Bragança or Elvas or uh, Castelo Branco uh, in all regions, in all regions of, of Portugal. Depending on its specific application, natural based products must comply with highly strict rules in order to be included in European markets. The majority of natural ingredients for the health sector is used in supplements and herbal medicinal products. And herbal medicinal products must be, of course, in compliance with several directives. Um, the European Medicines Agency is the organism responsible for the scientific evaluation, supervision and safety monitoring of medicines in member states. This uh, commitment can make about uh, herbal medicinal products as well as used ingredients. There are mandatory legal, legal requirements for food supplements, uh, particular in the European Union food supplement legislation and in the European general food law. And the new novel food regulation approved in, in January uh, 2018 is another essential tool to ensuring food safety. Established ingredients for food supplements are listed in the novel food catalog, the union lists and the botanical lists for food supplements. In addition, there is the need to provide data also, of course, on toxicological, microbiological and allergenic properties. So all in all, the potential of natural products is immense and every effort should be uh, dedicated to use this potential in differentiated industrial application, always complying with the, with the strict legal framework that rules these particular industrial sectors. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I wish you all a very good Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Isabel, for your words. They're always very inspiring and, uh, and they inspired me during all my life. So uh, uh, I, I, I thank you very much for your uh, time to be with us in this opening session, which I also know that this topic is with, within a, a, a theme really close to you and in which you worked along many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today. So thank you for your words. Thank you, goodbye. Goodbye. Um, now I will pass the, the floor to our uh, moderator for this section. Uh, the, this Congress is divided, like I mentioned, in three areas, uh, health, food, and uh, cosmetic. This morning, we will be talking about, uh, about uh, uh, health, natural products linked to health. And um, the moderator today will be, uh, for this section, will be uh, Dr. Suraya Falcão. So I will give the screen to um, Suraya at this moment.
Good morning. Uh, next, we'll have the presentation of two keynotes, which one with a duration of 25 minutes, followed by five minutes of questions. The, pu the public can ask the questions uh, that arise in the chat of the YouTube channel. Uh, some of the questions will be selected and will be asked to the speakers in the end of their presentations. Just a brief note about the posters. The posters uh, are available online for consultation uh, and they are organized by category and they can be download downloaded. So uh, for the first keynote, uh, I I'll have the pleasure to present Professor Maria Grace Campos. Professor Maria Graça Campos is professor of pharmacognosy at the Faculty of Pharmacy, uh, University of Coimbra, uh, and she is coordinator of Observatory of Drug Interactions. The main topics of research include drug discovery, especially with B products, and pharmacovigilance in drug herb interactions, mainly with oncologic patients. Uh, uh, her keynote is entitled Global, Globalization of Beehive Products in Food and Health. So I pass the, the word to Professor Maria Graça Campos. Okay, good morning to everyone. Uh, before we go further, I want to thank to the to thank to the organizing committee the invitation to be here today to share with you some data, some thoughts, and some concerns, of course. I also want to thank to all the players involved with the products, of course, including um, to all my team and all the researchers that I work with. In this next minute, I'm going to be taking a look at the product's potential based on the research that is already done. And um, I will give, um, I will show you some of these works around the world. So I will highlight what uh, I see as the main areas of expertise. And to do that, I choose uh, in a random way, as you mentioned, uh, some publications from different countries correlated to different uh, B products, just to give you a, a broad idea what is going on around the world. Of course, um, I could not put a hold. So forgive me if uh, I didn't uh, put some of your work. I mentioned that some of you that are now assisting um, have done very uh, good research. And for the others that are just beginning, I did a file, a zip file that I sent to uh, the organizing committee with uh, a good amount of uh, very recent publications. Some are cited in these uh, presentations, presentation, but others I didn't have the place to put to them because as I said, they were too much. So please feel free to ask to the organization this presentation that is also in the zip file. And of course, all the, the um, publications that I put there. So um, let's uh, uh, get started. When we talk about globalization, of course, we talk about quality. Without that, we cannot move the products around the world, the world and we cannot have the same uh, um, uh, function for all of them. So. Uh, it's fundamental that we have uh, products they are synthesized. Be sure about the storage and of course, to add the value to this product, we need innovation. I will talk 
briefly about some applications of bee products in food and pharmaceutical industry. We have now a good amount of information that is collected uh, for, um, I could say more than 100 scientists, colleagues that work in different levels with the, the bee product and the standard methods to work with this product are uh, already published in uh, Colossus B book and the uh, ones missing ones pollen in venom will be published this year so for standard methods of analysis we have already a good tool where we can go uh, get this uh, information just for uh, highlight some uh, of the products they are already categorizing as food or as pharmaceuticals. I show you here these codex alimentaries that you know. And there we have uh, already a standard method of for honey, for honey. So it's already classified as a food. However, I hope that in the near future, we could have also bee pollen and bee bread categorizing as a food too because they have all the potential what we need is in fact uh, do what is already completed i will show in the next slide for pharmaceutical purposes we have also our holy bible so our holy bible are the pharmacopoeias around the world uh, soon we will have a global pharmacopoeia. We are working on this in um, World Health Organization. But for now, for example, I show you what we have in the European one. And there we have already two, three products from the hive. As you can see, we can we have Biwox and we have Honey. Those are the monographs for quality control of this product to be used in pharmacy. And we have also EPIs themselves. So we use them as um, in homeopathic preparations. And as you can see, we have already um, high products introduced in pharmacopoeias and i hope that all the others could be very soon introduced to for pharmaceutical purposes because as i will show um, later on in this presentation we have a huge potential of these products in this field in many uh, ways we are working also in ISO normalization. You know that uh, these uh, norms are not mandatory. Nevertheless, they are fundamental to normalize some of the uh, information that should be done with this uh, product. We have now uh, these working uh, um, groups. We are uh, Ophelia and myself, we are in people and uh, group. We know that uh, in most of them, we have Portuguese people, Portuguese researchers. Thank you all for the nice work that you are doing. And um, for Poland, we have uh, Ophelia as convener and um, Wong Liang as secretary. The other groups are more advanced in the norms. So, I hope that we can uh, catch them. Well, let's move for food industry. We have uh, products that are clearly uh, involved in food or as a food because they have an important nutritional content. Otherwise, we can also use them in processing due to these important bioactivities. So I will show uh, some of the examples that we have uh, in a different way that we can use these products. For example, for bee bread, now we are trying to get the best information possible 
to um, classify the nutritional content selected by a species, what uh, um, was um, at the beginning something that probably uh, we, didn't, we didn't think that we could do. But uh, in this work that we published with colleagues in Romania, we were able to identify clearly the species, the origin species. So this was one sample of Brassica and another one from eucalypt in different regions in, in Romania, what means that we, go, we can go farther in the use of the product if we classify the floral origin and we'll have a reproducibility of the product. For pollen, uh, we know almost everything that we could know about pollen. Research in pollen uh, is uh, already, um, I could say almost complete because we know so many things about the, the nutrients, the micronutrients, um sorry i missed here the vitamins i'm really really sorry uh and we know lots of bioactivities uh, as i will show in the next minute with pollen we know already uh clearly very good amount of floral origins they are distributed around the world and for all of them as i will show we can get important bioactivities and clearly application in industries. For example, we have this work that we did with Ethiopia. We have here coffee and tobacco pollens. They are very, very specific. And here we have coconut pollen. And Brazil, for instance, have uh, tons of these products. And some of the research carried out is anti-tumor. So we have uh, important application of these products in the industry. Moving to processing. When we want to get the best of a product, we need to um, get the best of the bioactivity. And the storage is fundamental to uh, be sure that we uh, get at the end the same bioactivity that we have at the beginning. These colleagues from Braganza and from uh, um, Castel Branco, they did a, a very important uh, research exactly uh, showing the importance of frozen uh, be pollen to get the best uh, um, prevention of oxidation for lipids, for instance. And uh, this allowed to use this bioactivity uh, in innovation. And for innovation, what they did was compare the conventional antioxidant with the pollen itself and the extract. They are black puddings and very typical in Portugal. And they verify that uh, these two um, compounds, uh, sorry, products could prevent better than the conventional uh, antioxidant. They verify that B pollen was a little bit more active than the extract. This happened many times. However, depending what we want to do in industry, in my point of view, sometimes it's better to use the extract because they are um, more easily to standardize. And uh, I think it's a, a very good application for some of the compounds uh, in bee pollen. Yanka and uh, our group also did a similar um, essay, but with cookies. In this case, we had, uh, as in the other one, of course, we have compounds. And these compounds can fortify the products. What is quite interesting, when she was working with us, uh, we did a work with beer. It's not published yet, but probably in, in the next conference, I can show you this data. 
So as I said, we have other examples in the, the, the bibliography and uh, we can see them in this zip file where I put some of these uh, papers. Well, going forward, I think that everyone knows honey. Uh, what can I say that you don't know already? It, it, it's clear that we have a high content of sugar but we also have some micronutrients. I, I leave here just a paper from Morocco just to, to show you that, uh, as I said, I showed different countries around the world. We, we have lots of information about honeys from different countries. And this is really good because uh, each of these countries can explore the flora that they have. And coming back, uh, what I was saying is, for example, a good application for honey is in dehydrated people. So you can dilute the, the honey and give in the water because it uh, uh, will help uh, even to restore the um, enzymes, uh, microorganisms. Well, now my field, because as you know, I work uh, in uh, pharmacy, so this is more my, my area. For all these the products, I will base the, the next uh, uh, slides of this presentation in this chapter that I wrote with Ophelia and Helmedy for the book, No Bees, No Life, and also in these two papers, uh, this one uh, I wrote with the colleagues from uh, um, China and uh, Turkey in Italy about royal jelly and uh, for bee pollen and bee bread. It's a, a joint venture with uh, Romania and Turkey. Well, I uh, must say that uh, I use the materials that we have that we prepare to these uh, papers. So some of the tables look uh, uh, smaller. I didn't want to cut them too much, but I highlight, I highlight what are the main points um, to think about. And you also have these papers in the chapter in the folder, so please feel free to, uh, to get them. Well, for walks, we'll start with walks. Uh, walks, as I show you at the beginning, is already in the pharmacopoeia, not in only in the European pharmacopoeia, but in many others. What we have here are mainly glycerides, fatty acids, and long chain alcohols. So it's easy to understand that this mix gives a product with a very good stability, didn't vary with pH or master levels. Uh, what uh, um, it's wonderful to be used in pharmaceutical technology due to the hydrophobic matrices that can the, be used in drug delivery, in tablets, suspensions, in plants, and microspheres. So a huge potential in pharmacy and uh, in fact uh, um, can add value to the product. Moving to Royal Jelly, we did uh, a comparison among the, the main compounds uh, in different uh, products uh, of Beehive, but uh, what is important here is that uh, once again, we need to have a clear information about the species, the floral origin of the product. This will change a little bit in the amounts and kind of components that we will have inside. In this scheme, we can see clearly how we do drug discovery. So we start the main matrix, we uh, check the, the compounds inside, we split in different isolated compounds, and after yes, we can go to the bioactivities. So we have here antimicrobial, home healing, 
um, some information about the possibility to use as anti-cancer, what are the compounds that we can use for. And this is the way to go. Otherwise, the results are not reproducible. We can have always the same thing with the same product if we don't have this information rationalized and well categorized. So the main uh, bioactivities for royal jelly, uh, as we classify for the information that we have more, are antioxidant activity, one healing, immunomodulatory, and anti-aging. As you can see here, we also know already what are the main mechanisms of action. And this allowed us to go further in development of a new drug, because otherwise we could not establish the efficacy, the toxicity. So if these compounds are not safe, we cannot use them for drug uh, discovery. Sorry, I need to take some water. Well, as I said, I think the most of us know lots of things about honey, but I could not moving forward without talking about uh, uh, the work of Peter Mullen. Peter Mullen uh, is a professor from New Zealand. I had the opportunity to work with him when I was there. And uh, he was the father of the application of honey in on healing with all the information that allowed us now to have in the hospitals the bandage that we can use in burns, in surgical um, wounds. And in fact, it was a, a good step and an important step in the evolution of this product. Of course, all this research was carried out with uh, Nitasia, uh, endemic from New Zealand, Manuka. But uh, um, for example, for snows and slavonoids, in Poland, the compounds are very, very similar to our eucalyptus. I think that uh, maybe someone could do uh, similar um, research here. Well, another application that uh, usually we attribute to propolis is the antiviral activity. But we also have uh, good data for the same use uh, with honey, in this case, in herbs. For propolis, please be careful with the preparation of the extract because some of the compounds can infect uh, induce uh, allergies in skin. So before apply in the lips, anything that could cold allergy or even give some color to the skin should be taken out. Well, I work in Poland in Bibrev, as you already uh, have understand, I think. So I will detail a little bit more this data. We did in this uh, uh, paper some tables, long tables, by the way, but uh, I just choose uh, some of the information from them about the main bioactivities that we have a good correlation among the original um, floral origin and the bioactivities. You have here some examples for the anticarcinogenic bioactivity, Brassica, Cisto, Celex, anti-inflammatory also, and for cystos, in fact, we have good data about the activity uh, in osteoporosis. You know that this is a kind of problem that nowadays it's important to help in this therapeutic uh, pathology. Well, with this pathology, with other uh, tools in therapy. So, it's very important if we could develop a drug using these uh, uh, extracts. 
for the hepatoprotective activity. The data that we get are from Castania and Brassica, uh, Poland. However, I must alert that all the hepatoprotective products that we have didn't matter if I have, they are these ones or extracts from plants or even um, chemicals uh, prepared just by synthesis. They are products that when they act in the liver, they can produce drug interaction. So if people are taking drugs, please avoid this kind of product. Otherwise, something can go wrong in the therapeutic. Well, moving on in these uh, bioactivities for uh, B pollen and B bread, we also found a huge activity antimicrobial. I think that is the kind of bioactivity that is crossing all the products in beehive. And we have lots of data for the different uh, um, microorganisms and also for a uh, huge variety of floral origins. In Portugal, we have a nice group working on this. So they also get lots of information from different species and uh, with different uh, microorganisms that uh, we can use uh, honey, uh, oh, sorry, honey, of course, and uh, uh, in this case, uh, bee pollen. Another bioactivity that is uh, quite explored in lots of products and also in bee pollen is the antioxidant bioactivity. In the most of the cases, this bioactivity is due to flavonoids or phenolics in general. What is important is that uh, nowadays we have an increase in degenerative pathologies, Alzheimer, Huntington's, Parkinson, arthritis, and uh, the possibility to use compounds with antioxidant power, um, it will be possible a way to go. So, Recently, we wrote this paper for the Huntington's disease. This is a genetic mutation that induces disease. So we don't have a cure for this pathology, but we can manage to delay uh, the symptoms of the disease. And for the other pathologies that I showed before, Alzheimer, Parkinson, arthritis, probably we could use the same uh, uh, way to go. So here we discuss the application, the use of the dietary flavonoids, in fact, to help uh, the patients with this pathology. And of course, as I said, we can apply for others. Another new application is the use of uh, uh, bee pollen, and in this case, in a mix with propolis, to reduce neural inflammation in a model of autism. Here they use the effect of a, a prebiotic uh, um, rich diet in uh, this uh, um, model to decrease neural inflammation. However, please take care when we extrapolate this information for humans because the use of prebiotics, probiotics, or even the symbiotics when we put all together is not yet well proven. So we know exactly if they stay in boas, in the intestines, then they can exert the effect that theoretical we think that they do. Now, the last bioactivity um, is antitumoral. As you know, we have uh, also an increase in oncology. Uh, we have lots of patients and new, um, better and more antitumoral drugs are in fact needed. So some of the information that is now carried out with this product and even with the others that I will show are fundamental to achieve new drugs. 
We have already some clinical trials going on, but we still need to go and to do lots and lots of much more to uh, complete the data that is needed to can have these new drugs. We have uh, other products from behind uh, under this investigation, as for example, Propolis. Our colleagues from Baragansa are also doing a wonderful job on this issue. And uh, another product that is explored with this bioactivity is happy toxin. Mainly at the beginning, we use it for really pain or chronic inflammatory diseases, but we have already information in some papers that we can explore the antitumoral activity with success. Helmedi with the colleagues from Braganza are also in his PhD degree exploring this potential. So as you can see, from these high products, we can have um, a possibility to develop important drugs for health application. So just recapping, um, importance to have a floral origin or the identification of the product, standard methods, I think we have already a good work done normalization we are going um, we are completing the data uh, sooner i think and of course with all this if we validate the bioactivities we will have an important add value to this uh, product thank you so much uh, thank you professor maria graça campos for this excellent review on the B products. Uh, so now, um, before going to the questions, uh, Professor Grassa shared with the Congress organization all the material used in the presentation. If someone wants to consult, just send an email to the Congress organization. So now we'll pass uh, to the questions. Um, so I, I'm going to 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 ask. Uh, I don't know if we don't if we have questions from the public. I think uh, no, but I'm going to ask uh, some. Um, uh, you clarified the potentials uh, and the handicaps in the use of the B products, uh, but in, in your opinion. What are the main main handicaps, um, or which steps we have to overcome to pass from the studies in the laboratory uh, to the use of the consumers in, in the health area, for example? Uh, we need to clarify. So I cannot use, for example, the pollen directly or propolis or epitoxin in oncology, of course. So for health, if I want to use in oncology this product, it's clear that we need to isolate the main compounds that are responsible for this bioactivity, and we need to carry all the steps. So finish all we have already done and go to the clinical trials. And after, of course, we can develop a drug. Otherwise, we have, for example, the possibility to uh, use uh, honey to uh, hydrate people, as I said at the beginning. In some cases, in nutritional point of view, we can have this uh, uh, product as bee bread or bee pollen because they have a high uh, um, nutritional uh, content. However, for... Um, uh, Home made is what you want to say. How we can use this product, home made, uh, just in our uh, home, or or just going to the industry because they are two different things. Yes, I know, uh, but it's uh, like uh, you know things. You know, we see a lot of uh, scientific works telling uh, these propolis is good for these, bee pollen is good for these. 
So uh, there's always a, a, a big um, handicap between the scientific, the, the, um, the information that goes out from a lab and then to the consumers, the use of the, of the consumers. Well, we, I think that in this century, we can, we should move on with all the data that we have from research. We, we should move on from the traditional uh, medicine and validate it, this product uh, with all the um, safety information that we have. Imagine, for example, what I said for um, propolis that we can use for antimicrobial activity. In fact, and you work on that, but uh, if I have an infection, I will not take uh, uh, propolis. I will take uh, antibiotic. Mm -hmm. That is already yes. prepared <laughs> in the right uh, uh, formulation. So I know that is uh, the efficacy and the safety for these dose that I need to take to um, fight this infection. So um, for me, it's quite difficult to use. Uh, I, I know and I apply a few things in my, in my family, let's say, and I also uh, give uh, uh, lectures in phytotherapy. So mm -hmm. I teach how to use some medicinal products, but uh, we need to be very, very careful with the side effects and the toxicity. And for example, propolis is very good, but it's also very toxic. As for example, epitoxin, okay? It's differently if I talk about honey or if I talk about pollen. Those are clearly products that I can use with a nutritional um, value. And in certain cases, I can use them to give a little bit more of bioactivity. It's the difference if I want to... Um, so the big idea is we have a homeostasis in our body that uh, should be um, put in, in certain uh, levels, okay? If I have a, a small uh, um, imbalance on this homeostasis, I can use some of these products. But if the homeostasis have uh, um, huge differences in the lab, I need to use drugs, proper drugs that I have uh, the right dose uh, and I know all about the side effects. And even on, in these cases, I can have collateral effects that are not very good. My, so, my concern is more, imagine that we use one of these products and we have uh, an important side effect. This will kill the product. This goes in the news and will kill the product. So we need to be very careful with the advice that we give to population to take these natural products um, just to cure without a, a good reflection. So we have a question from the, the public. Okay. Is, are there uh, standard, standardized tests for the antibacterial properties of honey and for wound healing. Wound healing. Uh, the, the first is have... antibacterial properties. <laughs> okay. We don't have this, I think, in Colos. Anyway, mm. I, I, well, yes, 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 you have. We have, we have. For pollen, not for honey, not for honey. In the Colos P book, and I think is. Uh, Free for consultation in web in the web, you can go for these chapters. I don't know if they have for honey, but we have for uh, bee pollen. Um, by the way, it was um, uh, this part of our chapter was written for, by Leticia and uh, some of uh, their their collaborators. So yes, we have there what we propose as a standard method. So what we did was looking in all the methods that were already published and select 
uh, what could be the best one to be used by all the researchers. Yes. Okay. Healing. Um, I don't remember to find anything. Okay, so uh, we don't have more questions. Again, I thank you for the excellent uh, uh, presentation and thank you for being present here in this Congress. Thank, thank you. Thank you too. Thank you. Good now, luck. Uh, yes, now we'll pass to the next, to the second keynote, uh, which is my pleasure to present Dr. Pedro Cantiste. Uh, he is a medical doctor specialized in physical and rehabilitation medicine, uh, competences in medical hydrology and pain medicine, consultant at the Centro Hospitalar Universitario do Porto, professor at the University of Porto, president of the International Society of Medical Hydrology and of the Portuguese Society of Medical Hydrology and of the Portuguese Society I'm repeating <laughs> of the, the medical hydrology, uh, uh, sorry. So the keynote will be entitled Thermal Products, Mineral Water, Peloids and Gases. Thank you very much for your introducing words, uh, uh, Dr. Sraya Falcão. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to salute every one of you, dear participants, and uh, also to thank the kind invitation to be present here uh, to the Mountain Research Center of the Bragança Polytech Institute, especially to Professor Maria José Alves and Dr. Lilian Barros. Thank you very much for your assistance during the preparation of, of this conference. And I would like to address my best regards uh, to Professor Isabel Freire, Secretary of State of our government, for the interior cohesion of our country, of Portugal, and also to Professor Orlando Rodrigues, President of the Bragança Polytech Institute. And also to thank the excellent uh, keynote lecture of uh, Professor Maria Graça Campos. I learned a lot about bees and bee products, and I am very interested, I must say, because I dedicate also some of my research to osteoporosis, and I will contact you about uh, uh, the mechanisms of uh, uh, these products uh, uh, in osteoporosis. <laughs> so this okay. is a challenge. <laughs> I, I stay here. So uh, let me uh, share with you my screen now. I hope that uh, I can uh, enter this. So let me see. Uh, let me see if I can now. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. What happens now with this? Not here. Are you, I think it's now okay? Is it okay? Yes. Yes, okay. So let's start. So uh, I was asked to speak uh, about uh, uh, this topic, thermal products. And uh, as you may imagine, I only can make a very synthetic approach uh, to these subjects due to the short time we have. Uh, nevertheless, I hope this presentation may be useful for you and give some clues to develop your uh, study and motivate uh, uh, your uh, interest and knowledge about thermalism. Well, uh, what are thermal products? By thermal products, I mean uh, the substances used for treatments within thermal medicine. And these include especially mineral waters, pelloids, and thermal gases. And uh, I must say that these products, special mineral waters and pelloids, are used uh, since thousands of years in almost all human civilizations. <clears throat> of course, initially, this use was purely <coughs> an empiric practice, but nowadays it has a scientific basis 
and must, may be included in what we call evidence-based medicines. This means um, the evidence by uh, the perform of randomized controlled trials, which is consider the level one, level 1A of uh, uh, evidence in uh, EBM. Well, uh, despite the fact that we have already quite a lot of scientific knowledge, research is, of course, much needed on this field. Uh, the first idea and the first uh, th thought that I would like to share with you is about the need to have an international glossary uh, in this field. In fact, the first step to, to develop cooperation and exchange of knowledge on scientific research is to speak the same language. Uh, this means that we should respect an international glossary. Uh, and of course, uh, why that? Because nowadays, uh, words are not only to speak, but they serve as keys and codes to have access to automatic information, informatics, and to spread it into the scientific knowledge to uh, obtain uh, an international, a global cooperation. So we need to use the same terms corresponding to the same concepts and definitions if we want to reach and spread the right information. I'll give you an example. Usually you talk about thermal water, but in fact, the, the consensualized term nowadays is no more thermal. Instead, we use mineral water or natural mineral water. So temperature is no more the defining criteria for uh, uh, define uh, this kind of natural product. Uh, in fact, uh, when we talked before about thermal, uh, we referred about uh, 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 water that uh, came in a source with uh, um, a temperature above the body's temperature, which means above uh, 36, 37 uh, uh, Celsius, uh, grades Celsius. And uh, then it changed uh, uh, for the, the concept, and we refer to a water that uh, emerged uh, in a temperature above the ambience average. For instance, uh, 26, 27 is the local average uh, during the year would be, for instance, uh, 21 or 22. So nowadays, uh, the criteria to define a natural mineral water is the therapeutic effect. So as you see, uh, when I talk about, about thermal water, if I publish about thermal water, uh, I can miss uh, the target if I don't use as keyword or mesh word natural mineral water. Uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless this need, there isn't yet an universal consensus since low mineralized water, for instance, is not considered mineral water in many countries. If you go to, for instance, for East Europe, they don't consider a water, a low mineralized water like our Agua de Luz in Portugal, like lose the water, because it has a low mineral content. But in fact, if we take as criteria for the definition, the therapeutic effect, <laughs> the fact is that we have already, already some evidence of the, the pharmacologic effects, let's say that, uh, with this low mineralized water. So uh, our uh, international society, International Society of Medical Hydrology, which, uh, by the way, this year accomplished 100 years, 100 years, it was founded uh, in 1921, adopt as glossary uh, these two books. Uh, the main one is on your uh, right side of the screen, uh, was uh, written uh, by Professor Maria de Los Angeles Ceballos Sanz from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and it puts uh, the equivalent terms in several languages. It is very complete, and I think that is a wonderful tool for those who want to publish and study on this field. We have a second glossary, but only in German and English by uh, Christoph Kirchner. Anyway, I think that uh, uh, they are very useful for you to uh, 
um, for those who are interested in communicating in these fields. The other publication of reference and which is now the adopt uh, criteria for definition and concepts uh, is that one uh, published uh, in uh, 2010 and adopted in that uh, precise year at the Congress in Paris as the definitions um, uh, validated by the International Society. So this is a paper in which I have also the honor to participate uh, by Gutenbrunner, Bender, Karagum, and myself. The other uh, product that uh, uh, we're going to, to uh, approach here is Pelowitz. Now, by Pelowitz, Pelowitz is the umbrella designation for many natural products, and uh, uh, they were classified and systematized since 1949 in our International Society uh, uh, Conference in Dax, France, near Bordeaux. And here you have the publication that uh, currently uh, is the reference for this international consensus, uh, published by Professor Celso Gomes from the Aveiro University and more 10 uh, and more nine uh, collaborators uh, trying to have, uh, the, let's say, um, share the consensus, in, uh, especially in Europe. So you have here the reference of the publication, and I can send you to you. The, it's a free access publication on the web. But uh, as you see, uh, this is the, the classification, the table uh, of the classification uh, in Dax in France. It is in French, because at that time, French was also uh, a very... Um, um, used scientific language. Nowadays, we don't use uh, French. Uh, unfortunately, in my point of view, you, we only use English. Uh, 200 years ago, we used Latin. So <laughs> we need that equivalence. That's why we need an international glossary to have the same definitions in different language corresponding to the same concept. And that's why we need that correspondence in English. And in some fields, I must say that English is not enough. Uh, English is a very easy language with a very uh, simple grammatics, but sometimes, you know, the, the vocabulary, the terms miss, and we need to go uh, another way to Greek or, or Latin to incorporate the, these Latin and Greek terms in English or, and have the, the correspondent equivalents. So here you have the, the denomination, you have the origin, you have the chemical nature, you have the temperature, you have the conditions of maturations, and you see uh, boue in French, fangi, Italian, muds in English, schlam, German, and then the, the, all the designations, and sometimes you see mud, pit, uh, fangi, and uh, in fact, all these designations correspond to uh, different kinds of pelloids. So uh, again, if you are interested in, in developing the research in these very interesting uh, natural products with the pharmac pharmacologic effects and therapeutic effects, uh, very interesting, you need to uh, choose the correct words to define what you are talking about. So uh, mainly and very synthetically, I would say that uh, these peloids effects may be anti-inflammatory, quite, quite powerful, I must say. There are uh, the trials that compare, for instance, the inflammatory, anti-inflammatory power of some peloids in Italy, for instance, with the uh, indometacine and also with the diclofenac, and uh, the, they are equivalent uh, in power. This is really amazing. Uh, I myself, I must confess, I was amazed when I saw that, that work, especially from Professor uh, Simona Bellometti. Okay, you have also uh, other effects, namely on, on your skin, keratolytic, uh, of course, according to the kind of composition uh, of the uh, specific agent. Speaking about natural gases, uh, the main are these three, CO2, uh, sulfur gas, H2S, and radon. Uh, of course, when we talk of radon, we're talking about very, very, very small amounts of radon, uh, where we exclude, of course, products that have uh, high levels of radioactivity. 
So uh, these are the, uh, some of the CO2 effects. They are quite important, for instance, on acting on the peripheral vascular resistance, mainly on hypertensive conditions. Uh, uh, for instance, also uh, on uh, uh, arrhythmias. So you have the, uh, the capacity of influence heart rate uh, variability. Uh, also uh, in the uh, skin and localized uh, adipositis. And uh, uh, as uh, an arcosis therapy could be uh, an important method uh, for treatment of uh, some kinds of neurosis and uh, psychosomatic conditions. Uh, concerning uh, sulfur gas, uh, I would say that uh, uh, it uh, can mediate regulation of uh, apoptosis Signaling ameliorates adverse cardiac remodeling and diabetic cardiomyopathy. Uh, it gives some myocardial protection against ischemia and reperfusion injury. Uh, it also seems to have therapeutic benefits on Alzheimer's disease. And very recently, some studies uh, pointed uh, uh, H2S as a potential defense against COVID-19. Of course, this, is the, this, uh, uh, this research is in the beginning, but there are some uh, interesting findings about this. Concerning uh, radon therapy, well, I, I would say that uh, radon has mostly an anti-inflammatory effect, and there are several methods of uh, uh, administrating radon in water baths. This is very old, uh, since, for instance, 96 in Czech Republic or in Bad Gastein in Austria. Um, also, by drinking therapy, what, which you call hydropenia, for instance, in Bad Brambach in Germany, inhalation in Poland, uh, in the United States, in Austria also. And uh, in the United States, in Europe, there are several radon spas specialized on radon therapy with iron atmosphere and also in health mines uh, in established in uh, Bastion and Montana. I'm not uh, at all an expert on radon therapy, but uh, our colleague Albert Falkenbach uh, published a lot about this and that's interesting findings uh, uh, about the, uh, this uh, kind of therapy. Now, uh, I will finish by, uh, I think, the, the main product that uh, we use uh, in Europe uh, regarding uh, uh, spa therapy products, uh, which are mineral waters. And uh, the current definition of uh, mineral waters is natural waters, of course, of deep circulation. This is very important. It's not lakes. It's not uh, rivers. We're calling about uh, water that infiltrates uh, the deep, has a long, long way in, uh, in subterranean uh, geologic uh, formations. And during that uh, long uh, circulation, uh, it happens that uh, it uh, gain uh, some uh, uh, soluble contents, some mineral contents, also some biological contents. So the physical and chemical characteristics allows therapeutic properties to be attributed to them. Uh, mineral waters has a very stable composition. So if you go to a source, each mineral water has uh, our own identity and it practically don't change along uh, uh, all the year. So we're talking about uh, uh, a period of circulation underground, uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, 9th centuries, 10th centuries. So if you drink, for instance, uh, Agua das Pedras from our region, uh, you are drinking a water that came from the rain almost 1,000 years ago. So this is very important. That's why uh, that long uh, way uh, gives the, the possibility of getting the stability. I must say that uh, on the designation of mineral waters, we can also include the gaseous waters, uh, even if the gas content uh, could be reinforced with the gas from the source itself. It is the only change that is allowed to do in, a, in a mineral water. Why mineral waters acts? 
because the, they have several therapeutic factors, mechanisms. Now, physical mechanisms, it is different to take a bath on, uh, for instance, uh, on a tube with a water of uh, 34 degrees or 38. It is different uh, according to the chemical composition. And I must say that some biological contents are also useful to have some therapeutic properties. Some uh, vestiges of, uh, for instance, RNA uh, can give some uh, uh, properties uh, to the water and gave also the identity. Uh, well, this is not uh, yet uh, still study, but is a very important research line, for instance, here in Portugal. And of course, you know that you cannot uh, deny uh, the very important psychological uh, effects and the psychological effects indirectly uh, influence uh, your, uh, let's say, interaction with the waters uh, by, for instance, immunomodulation. I uh, deeply believe on this. Okay, so you have a multitude of mineral waters. You have thousands of mineral waters in our nation. So you need to know them better, to systemize, to classify it. And usually uh, we use five criteria for classifying the water, to classify the water, physical and biological and chemical. Now the temperature, the osmotic pressure, radioactivity, mineralization and chemical composition. Uh, by the way, I let you hear a curiosity. One of the oldest treaties of classification of mineral waters uh, from a very well-known doctor from the 18th century, uh, Dr. Mirandella, because he was from our region, from the city of Mirandella, Francisco da Fonseca Rix. He was uh, a doctor on the court of uh, our king, uh, João V, John V. And this was published in 1726. It was very complete, and it is still uh, uh, very, uh, let's say, very, very actual here, very, very current. Uh, this was considered the first companion book of classification of systemization of the Portuguese mineral waters. Here you have. Recently, it was republished on the a facsimile edition. Uh, I will talk only uh, about the criteria of mineralization and chemical composition because we don't have time to uh, approach more topics. Uh, I must say that there is not uh, an uniform uh, uh, accept criteria for these uh, thresholds on mineralization. It varies from school to school, even in Portugal, from the school of Coimbra to Lisbon, and of course from country to country. Uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, nowadays the international society um, is reaching an international consensus about this, and I hope that at least in the four, uh, next uh, two or three years we will uh, have it uh, definitely published. Now, I give you some examples here. I, I don't want, uh, I don't have time to enter into details, but anyway, uh, you can see that we can have waters weakly mineralized, low mineralized, strongly mineralized. And here you have the difference of, of the, uh, the contents, for instance, from very weakly mineralized, like uh, again, uh, Luz or Vitalis in Portugal, you have less than 50 milligrams per liter. And then if you go, for instance, to a high mineralized, you can have two grams, for instance, 2000 milligrams, two grams per liter. Regarding the chemical composition, this gives you the label, uh, the designation to the mineral water. Um, bicarbonated, sulfated, chlorinated, sulfurous, sodium, calcic, etc. So on. So uh, if you, here you have the thresholds, hmm? the different thresholds you consider to have the label of bicarbonate, sulfate, and sodium, and so on. And then you have also a very important point. When you talk about sulfur waters, uh, you have uh, you can have less than uh, 500 milligrams, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, with this uh, title uh, of uh, sulfur, you consider sulfurous water. So to finish and in conclusion of my lecture, if if we go to get uh, a treatment or to have health benefits uh, more than treat uh, a disease, I can go to a 
uh, station, a thermal station to promote my health, what do you have as a comprehensive therapy? Of course, uh, we're talking about thermal medicine and the uh, World Health Organization recognize this tip, uh, this kind of practice, this type of uh, practice, uh, and calls it health resort medicine. So we're talking about uh, procedures of diagnostic and treatment, not only treatment, also diagnostic. And uh, we uh, do not only treat, but we have health promotion. So we have health promotion by uh, having a better prevention, a better therapy, and a better rehabilitation. This is what you are doing in the field. Then the core elements of this complex therapy, thermal medicine, is the use of natural mineral waters, gases, and pellets. That's why we are here on a natural products conference, because we use, in fact, natural products. But we also use tap water. Now we're talking about complementary techniques, for instance, that we call hydrotherapy. When we use mineral waters, we call it cranotherapy. Creno came from the Greek, krenos, which means fountain, source. So we make the difference between cranotherapy, we use natural mineral water, and hydrotherapy, which use common water, tap water, plain water. So in spa therapy, in thermal, we can use, for instance, on collective practice, such as hydrokinesiotherapy, exercise on swimming pools, for instance, this is not cranotherapy, but could be thermal medicine by complementary techniques, such as uh, kinesiotherapy uh, on pool, hydrokinesiotherapy, re-education, rehabilitation on pool. Okay, we use also climatic factors. This is very important. This is a natural uh, 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 variable, okay? So you can have uh, similar waters, but in different uh, climatic uh, uh, ambience, and you have different results. Uh, we have other uh, therapeutic factors, uh, namely sociologic, psychological. I gave uh, a lot of importance to the uh, interactive social interaction uh, in, uh, in therapy. And this is, uh, could be a, an excellent uh, tool to improve uh, our health. And of course, uh, the, uh, the contextual environment and factors. Now, we have also the methods or the modalities uh, baths, showers, drinking cures, inhalation, other techniques of respiratory uh, uh, treatments, uh, immersion without or only to uh, body parts, uh, and the agents, the substance, the factors, uh, CO2, sulfur gas, brine, uh, carbonated, sulfated, etc. Then we can do underwater exercise, we can perform thermotherapy, we can perform hydrogalvanic baths. So physical, physical medicine is also very important as a tool for this complex therapy. So as you see, to uh, design a study on the effects on thermal therapy is not easy because we have a lot of uh, variables and we need to uh, be very careful to prevent uh, bias and confounding factors. So the methodology to do research on uh, medical hydrology, on thermal medicine is very complex. Nevertheless, nowadays, I must tell you that in a recent uh, bibliographic uh, systematic review, I found thousands of studies of very good quality and more than 300 randomized control, control trials. And although it's very difficult to design blind uh, controls, I say that I find some, some of them, and uh, even double-blind studies are possible, but very difficult. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I am uh, at your disposition to answer your questions if I can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this excellent keynote, very clarifying. I learned a lot of thermal products. 
So now we pass to the questions. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, one from, uh, it's written, is from uh, Dr. Marcio Carocho. Uh, he says, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very broad and complete. I'm just curious about what you said about Agua das Pedras. Mm. How could it be that the water that we drink rain over 1,000 years ago? <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Marcio Carocci. It's a very uh, interesting question. In fact, um, we uh, in uh, thermal medicine, we uh, are, are hydrologic hydrologists, doctors. Uh, we work a lot uh, with uh, with the geologues. Uh, Professor Grassa, uh, hydrogeologists are our <laughs> pharmaceutics in thermal. <laughs> Not only the pharmaceutics, we count with you, but we need the 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 the, sci the scientists from geology to to help us and to understand. And so it's it's very simple. Uh, rain uh, falls. It has the capability of penetrate into the soil, into the ground, and has a long, long way going deeply on the rocks, having uh, that this way, and by some uh, uh, geologic uh, occurrences, for instance, a geologic fracture, they are able to ascend and to came and to emerge naturally. Of course, we can do this artificially. And if we know that we have an aquifer, a pool of mineral water on the deep, we can also detect and then make a, a hole, make a perforation. And with that forage, we can reach uh, the water. This must be very, very uh, uh, wise, very, very uh, scientifically controlled and rigorous Otherwise, we can have a natural disaster. And unfortunately, there are several of these disasters that kill that treasure, that preciosity of natural mineral water by, uh, bad, uh, by bad practice on this kind of procedure. So uh, again, the great uh, majority of mineral waters have a long way uh, during a long period of time and this time allow again to have the water enrich with mineral salts and other contents such as biological to have the product that for instance with Agua das Pedras we got. And this is very interesting of course and uh, nature is a precious gift. So we need to respect them. And I must confess my concern about uh, the way sometimes we deal uh, with uh, water mainly. <laughs> Okay, and of course, cl climatic clim climatic uh, changes that are on the on the table now, um, these are due to the uh, alterations to the change of the water cycle. That's what it is. We have no more water. We don't lose water. We have the same amount of water in our planet for millions of years. Like Lavoisier law says, we don't lose water. We don't create water. Simply. The cycle has changed. And this is how the problem we have because it's changed quickly without the possibility to adapt ourselves. And the, the, our health, our health is mainly found like our life, our biological life, but also our economic life is based on water point. So pay attention for what, how you deal with water. So you need a lot of knowledge more, especially in medicine. Uh, just uh, uh, final thought. Uh, doctors pass six years on uh, uh, medical schools in university, then five, six years on specialized, and they don't talk about water. There is only one share of medical hydrology in Portugal, which is mine. <laughs> so it's incredible. It's incredible because Water is, uh, we are water. We are water. We are uh, generated in water. All, all the biologic processes we have are on the uh, water uh, environment. And absorption, circulation, body functions are on water. And water is the mean to get better uh, pharmacological effects of, uh, and supplies. 
So uh, this is a very important thought. And those uh, like uh, in, in our Polytech Center are dedicated to natural products should in fact have uh, uh, this uh, very important thought in mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just one more question, very brief from uh, Professor Maria Graça Campos. She wants to post a question and I'm going to pass her uh, the word. Thank you. We are not listening, Professor Graça Campos, please. Okay. 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 Probably a challenger. I have a dream. I work with lots of oncologic patients. And one of my dreams is called for the cancers not so advanced to do the treatments in these um, thermal uh, facilities. First for the concept, and also because we can have a controlled ambience. So we could have a proper diet in an ambience that was friendly. And of course, we can have all this uh, information that you have also. In all this research that you have already done, uh, did you cross with something that we could, in fact, uh, use this to put a project? Oh, oh this, is, this is really, really the $1 million question. <laughs> really, <laughs> really, really. Well, uh, I'll try to be very short. It's not easy to be very short, but I, I'll try to put the problem first. Uh, in fact, uh, thermal therapy is a complex therapy. So we deal with nutrition, with exercise, exactly. and exactly. things that improve your health. Now, exactly. you can fight a disease by two ways. You can attack the pathogenic uh, mechanisms. And if you don't know that, for instance, like COVID, what you do, you can enhance uh, your body defense, your uh, what I call salutogens, health genes. Sorry, okay? uh, my question was mixed. So yes, we had of course. The of course. Therapy, but I think I the... think every, uh, Professor Grassa, everything in medicine, in my opinion, is mixed. Even when you give uh, an antibiotic drug, you have the effect uh, on the antibiotic on the microbial is microorganisms, but you have also the immunomodulation <laughs> of the, the of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. everything is mixed. Exactly. Concerning cancer, we have regarding mineral water, some mineral water show in lab some uh, potential, uh, some mitogenic potential. So we were afraid, we were much afraid of having cancers on the, especially on the, the first period uh, after, uh, before remissions, we were afraid. Okay, I then, see. Then, but then, but then, we thought about the complex therapy and now we uh, enter the specific research for cancer. So nowadays, for instance, in France, there is a research line concerning several cancers. And we started by the uh, rehabilitation of cancer disease. And we have now already some clues, uh, some, uh, um, let's say some signs that we have positive effects. And again, uh, let's separate things. The, 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 the pharmacy mineral uh, water, and then the comprehensive therapy. It's, mm -hmm. it, you need to, 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 to study both. Huh? You need to study yeah, yeah. the specific action of that specific composition uh, for the specific cancer, and the mood of modulation that we know that some mineral waters can give to specify some uh, uh, um, response of antibody response, and then the comprehensive therapy. So I would say that in I, 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 I'm convinced that the next 10 years will bring interesting data on that research. Perfect. Thank you. I think. So uh, thank you very much for you both for the excellent keynotes. And now uh, we'll have, uh, we'll pass for the oral communication section uh, for the health category and that which will be uh, moderated by my colleague, Dr. Maria Inês Dias. Thank you, Soraya. Good morning, everyone. I'm Inês Dias and I will moderate the second session for the health issue of today. We will start with an invited oral communication followed by six oral presentations. Just a reminder for the participants of the Congress, 
you can leave your uh, questions in the comment sections of the live streaming in YouTube. And you can also consult and download the, post the posters uh, on the Congress website. Uh, without further ado, and because we are a little bit late, I would like to present our guest for the oral communication, Dr. Ana Novo Barros. Good morning, Dr. Barros. Good Hope morning. everything is okay with you. Uh, you. Dr. Barros is an assistant professor with habilitation at the chemistry department of UTAV and also the director from the Center for the Research and Technology of Agro-Environmental and Biological Science, named CITAV. Uh, her area of expertise is the valorization of byproducts, taking into account the circular economy and, and industrial symbiosis. And her work has been recognized with the attribution of several prizes and awards. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Varus. Today, um, the work that Dr. Barros will be presenting for us today is entitled Fighting Diabetic Foot Ulcers, Resorting to Winery Byproducts, Grape Steams Case. Dr. Barros, you have eight to 10 minutes for your presentations and I will pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And before I start my communication, I just would like to tell you that I'm going to do this in the memory of my father that just died last week with a degenerative disease. And uh, I'm really a believer that natural compounds can be so helpful for the prevention and for the treatment of this and the other diseases of our time. Now I'm going to share my communication. Yes, we okay. can. Thank you so much. And now uh, starting with the presentation, and before everything, I would like to thank to the organizing committee the opportunity and the invitation to present a work that has been developed in the University of Trados Montes and Alto Douro, in particular in the Center for the Research and Technology of Agroenvironmental and Biological Sciences, CITAB. The work that I'm going to present is entitled Fighting Diabetic Foot Ulcers Resorting to Winery Byproducts grape stems case. This is the culminar of several years of work in the valorization of grape stems cultivars, giving them an added value. My presentation is divided in five topics, the introduction, the objectives, the material and methods, the results, the, uh, sorry, the results in discussion and the conclusions. Starting by the introduction, uh, the antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest public health challenges of our time. Around the world, it is well established that about 2.8 million people get an antibiotic resistant infection and more than 35 million people die because of this. So our time with antibiotics is running out. Antibiotic resistance is a public health problem worldwide having an impact in morbidity and or mortality rates, especially in developing countries. According to the World Health Organization, in 2050, the antibiotic resistance will be the biggest cause of death worldwide, overcoming deaths from cancer, for example. One of the main causes of hospitalization are diabetic foot ulcer infections, mostly caused by Staphylococcus aureus, and due to the frequent use of antibiotics, Staphylococcus aureus strains have developed resistance to treatment. To combat the bacterial resistance, alternative antibiotics should be developed to overcome the effectiveness of the currently available. That's how it comes the grape stems case. Grape production is one of the main economic activities in the agri-food sector around the world. It is estimated that 52% of the production goes to the winery industry, whereas large quantities of byproducts are generated, namely organic residues, just like grape farmers, seeds, pulp, skins, grape leaves, grape stems, and wine leaves. Grape stems which correspond to 25% of the total byproducts, is less characterized and evaluated of the all byproducts generated in the winery industry, 
although it represents up to 7% at the raw material processing. Primarily, the grapes are harvested and before the vinification process, the stems are removed since their presence increases the astringency due to its richness in pro anthocyanidins affecting the wine's quality. So usually it is discarded in open areas or use it for composting, but it can cause some environmental problems and consequently it can compromise the sustainability and the competitiveness of this industry. So it is very important the adoption of new approaches providing the application of these byproducts in the development of innovative and added value products that can be used not only in food, but also in cosmetic and pharmaceutical industries, since they are rich in bioactive compounds that, are pre that present important biological properties for human health. These biological compounds, sorry, these biological uh, compounds are mainly flavonoids, steel bands, phenolic acids, and condensed tannins. To the, to the presence of these bioactive compounds, this method presents important biological properties, such as anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic, neuroprotective, anti-tumor activity. So it is very important to develop new products to combat antimicrobial active, uh, uh, resistance against not only again, uh, against uh, food uh, diabetic ulcers, but, but also against other uh, antimicrobial resistance. Thus, the objectives or main goals of this work are the identification and quantification of polyphenols present in grape stems from different varieties by spectrophotometric and chromatographic methodologies, the determination of antioxidant capacity of ethanolic extracts of grape stems, and the evaluation of antimicrobial activity, not only uh, from diabetic food wound bacteria, but also against gastrointestinal bacteria from patients from the hospital art center. To achieve these main goals, uh, our sample was composed by six grape stems varieties, four red varieties and two white varieties, and all the samples were collected in Quinta do Pinto in Alencar. The grape stem extract preparation was according with this procedure using food ethanol as solvent once it is an environmental friendly solvent and it is also compatible with food, pharmaceutical and cosmetic industries. For the quantification of the phenolic composition, we have used the following method, method for the determination of total phenols content, the complexation with aluminium chloride for flavonoids determination, and complexation with molybdate for the orthodiphenols content determination. The qualitative and quantitative analysis of phenolic compounds was done by HPLC, and for the identification of the phenolic compounds, it was taking into account the standards, the rotation times, order of evolution, UV spectra, and literature data. For the antioxidant capacity determination, it has been applied to the ABTS, DTTH, and FAP methodologies. For the antimicrobial activity evaluation, and as I told you in the objectives, we have used gram positive and gram negative bacteria not only from the uh, foot diabetic ulcers but also from the gastrointestinal tracts. So we have used the two different methodologies, the disc diffusion assay and the minimum inhibitory concentrations. We have used it as negative control, the MSO, and as positive control to antibiotics, gentamicin and ciprofloxacin. So as a result of our work, I can show you that about the phenolic content of the great stems that we have studied, the uh, total phenols and orthodiphenols presented the same behavior. And uh, you can observe that the Liga Nacional is the variety that presents the highest amount for these two parameters. And they are significantly different from the others. And uh, about the flavonoids content, although Fernão Pires is the variety that presents the highest value, it, is, it was not significantly different from Toriga Nacional and Tinta, Tinta Rodrigues. 
about the identification of the finale compound, we have identified in the uh, all, uh, all uh, uh, variety extracts with the difference of the anthocyanines that were uh, just identified in the red varieties, 11 compounds that were grouped in phenolic acids, flavonoids, and stilbenes. Once the antioxidant activity is correlated with the content of phenolic compounds, once again, Corriga Nacional presents the highest level and in all the uh, methodologies used, the values are significantly different from the other varieties. About the antimicrobial activity of grape stem extracts and by the disc diffusion assay, concerning gram-positive bacteria, all the studied varieties reveal the inhibition of bacterial growth, and in some cases, this antimicrobial activity revealed it to be higher than the antibiotics that didn't reveal any activity against two bacteria. In gram-negative bacteria, the great stem extract only inhibited the growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I can also tell you that, sorry, I'm passing it this part. I can also tell you that in the concentrations tested, the extracts from Toriga Nacional and CIRA presented the best results affecting the specific growth rate of Staphylococcus aureus isolates and revealed a bacteriostatic effect. So as a conclusion of this work, we can say that grep stem is an effective matrix in the inhibition of composite bacteria, especially for two of the bacteria studied. The, the grape stem extracts that presented antimicrobial activity revealed to be more effective than the antibiotics that were tested. And finally, we can say that grape stem can be reused for the cosmetic, pharmaceutical, and food industries. However, further studies are needed. To finish my presentation, I would like to thank the collaborators of this work, Professor Maria José Saavedra, Professor Eduardo, Dr. Irene Covinhas, and Dr. Carla Dias. And uh, sorry, but it has a problem. I don't know why. I would like just to show you uh, some photos of uh, our campus. Uh, I think that you can see it uh, and invite you, all of you, to uh, join us in OTAD when, when this pandemic situation finishes. Thank you very much. Dr. Barros, thank you for your presentations. Uh, first of all, in the name of the Congress organization, we would like to, to show you our condolences for your father. Thank it you. is a beautiful gesture that you um, show him tribute with your work, with uh, an excellent work. So he would be very proud, of course. Uh, Dr. So Barros, um, <clears throat> I would just like you to ask you, Two questions. Um, do you uh, uh, perform like a correlation study between the composition in phenolic compounds uh, and the, the biological effects that you study? And do you believe that are other type of compounds present in the, in the samples that you study that are responsible for the biological activities that you want to, 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 to study? Well, uh, we, we are studying the grape stems in two, in two uh, different uh, uh, situations. We are studying the biological compounds about the phytochemical composition. And in that case, we have made the correlation also, uh, in the individual compounds, we have made the HPLC preparative, and uh, we have seen that, for example, some white uh, varieties presented uh, uh, highest, uh, biggest uh, antibacterial activity than the red varieties. And we have seen that in some cases it was the presence of Diviniferin, for example, that was the responsible for that activity. Uh, mm -hmm. The other study that we are making, it's about the macromolecules that are present in grape stems, just like cellulose, hemicellulose, mm -hmm. tannins, yeah. and so this is two different kind of studies that we are in course. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Barros. Uh, I believe there is none, no more questions for you, but uh, if someone has um, a question that uh, that uh, want to pose to Dr. Barros, he, uh, he can contact us and we will um, reach to Dr. Barros so he, she can answer you. Thank you again, Dr. Barros. We hope Thank you to very see much. you next time. Um, good work. Thank you. Thank Have you. Nice Good work. Nice. So let's move on to our six oral presentations. We will begin with uh, Anna Teresa Serra. Uh, good morning, Anna. Uh, Anna will present to us the work entitled Unveiling the Protective Role of Natural Bioactive Compounds Towards Colorectal Cancer. Uh, Anna, um, I will pass to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the scientific committee of this online conference uh, for selecting our work for presentation in this session. Today, I will talk uh, about the work that we have been developing at IBET, um, focus on the study of natural, comp natural bioactive compounds in colorectal cancer. So it is well known that the Mediterranean diet is associated with a reduced risk of colorectal cancer, and this has been attributed to the presence of bioactive compounds, namely phytochemicals, that are reported to present anti-cancer effects. In this field, cruciferous vegetables, citrus fruits, and olive oil have been reported to contain glucosinolates, which are the main precursors of the more bioactive uh, compounds isothiocyanates, phenolic compounds such as polymethoxylated flavones and hydroxytyrosol, which present a cancer effect in vitro and in vivo. However, the majority of these studies were performed on cell growth on monolayers or animal models that present several limitations. So the monolayer cultures present uh, the limitation in mimicking the 3D tissue architecture, while animal models present ethical uh, dilemmas and they did not mimic the human tumor microenvironment. So during the last years, our team has been working on the development of 3D cell models of colorectal cancer to el elucidate the, prote the protective role of natural compounds derived from brassicas, citrus fruits, and olive oil to, uh, towards this disease. So the 3D cell model was generating by culturing uh, the HT29 cell line in stereo in stirred culture systems using these uh, spinner vessels. And using this system, we generate cell spheroids with different cell diameter, uh, diameter and, uh, character and characteristics during culture time. In particular, the spheroids collected at day seven of culture presented features of in vivo solid tumors, such as, um, uh, such as an apoptotic core, uh, an epoxia region, and also a stratified cell population and the structural complexity, as you can see here, the absence of epithelial cells in the spheroid outer ring, and the presence of cancer stem cells in the this, in this spheroid outer ring. Uh, additionally, this model presents a, high a higher percentage of cancer stem cells when compared with, with to the uh, cell cultures. So stem cells uh, have, uh, have been identified in all types of tumors and have been uh, highlighted to be responsible for tumor initiation, relapse, and chemo uh, resistance. So they, they have been pointing to be a promising target for cancer treatment. So we, we, we use this model to evaluate the anti-cancer potential of natural extracts and bioactive compounds. So in the case of brassicas, our aim was to evaluate uh, the effect of isothiocyanates in which extracts from watercress and broccoli in targeting cancer cell proliferation and stemness using this model. So the extracts were developed using supercritical fluid technology that showed to be effective in uh, extracting these compounds. So watercress extracts present phenyl isothiocyanate as the main compound, and the broccoli extract presents sulforaphane, but also other isothiocyanates and fatty acid derivatives. 
So when we test it in our 3D cell model, those extracts inhibit cancer cell proliferation, uh, induce cell cycle arrest and apoptosis, and modulate its cancer uh, stemness. Uh, importantly, only watercress extract um, showed to reduce the cancer uh, stem cell population. In the second case study, our aim was to evaluate the effect of polymethoxylated flavones isolated from orange pills in improving the antiproliferative of a chemotherapeutic drug. So the polymethoxylated flavones were, were isolated from uh, orange peels in order to valorize this type of agrofood residue. In this work, the supercritical fluid technology uh, was also used to extract this compound. And uh, as you can see here, it was very selective in uh, extracting polymethoxylated flavones. Senescentin, nubilitin, tangeritin, uh, and the scutlerin tetramethyl ether was, were the main um, compounds uh, isolated from the orange peel extracts. So the results showed that the extract, the uh, orange peel extract, inhibited cancer cell proliferation and target uh, cancer, stem, cancer stemness in the, in the 3D cell uh, model. Important combination studies with the 5 fluorocyl demonstrated that orange peel extract, uh, the mixture of the polymethoxylated flavones and also the compound alone, um, improved the antiproliferative effect of the drug, as you can see here, the line presented in black. Um, the highest synergistic effects were obtained between uh, tangeritin and scutlerin uh, tetramethyl ether and the, the 5 fluorocyl and this could be related with chemical structure of these compounds. In the last case study, uh, this study was focused on the evaluation of uh, the cancer potential of an oily compounds from virgin olive oil. So the compound selected was hydroxy and its two main colonic metabolites, such as phenylacetic acid and hydroxyphenyl propionic acid. It is important to mention that these compounds were previously detected in human feces after a diet supplementation with a phenol enriched uh, olive oil, which means that they, are, uh, they can reach the colon uh, to exert uh, their bioactive effect. We demonstrated that hydroxytrizol was the most effective antiproliferative compound in both monolayer cultures and in the 3D cell model. And hydroxytrizol was the only compound able to reduce the cancer stem cell population and inhibiting the colony forming unit capacity, which means that uh, this compound impacts the self renewal ability of the cancer cells. Overall, our results show that the 3D cell model is a promising tool to study the effect of food bioactives in colorectal cancer. And the phytochemical enriched extracts developed in our work, and also the isolated compounds, isotocyanates, polymethoxylated flavones, and hydroxytrizol, present antiproliferative effect and modulate cancer stemness in this advanced uh, model of colorectal cancer. Uh, uh, it is important to mention that the knowledge generated in this type of in vitro studies provides relevant information towards the design of uh, human intervention studies for cancer treatment. Finally, I would like to acknowledge to all the people and collaborators involved in this work from IBET, uh, uh, IPO and SIAL, uh, uh, our partners from the food, food industry, and also the funding received from IBET Export Project, Inova for Health, FCT, Cost Action and Programme of uh, FITEC. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Anna and Serra. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Since, since we are a, li a little bit uh, uh, running out of time, uh, I would like to, um, uh, to tell all of you from this first session to wait until the end of the session so we can gather all the questions and then we will make up the, the time that we, 
that we have, okay? So thank you, okay. Anna. Again, let's move on to our second presentation uh, that will be done by Carlos Gomes. Good morning, Carlos. Uh, Good morning. Carlos will present uh, the, the work entitled Anti-Aging and Neuroprotective Activity of Timus Carnosus, Accus and Hydroethanolic Extracts. Carlos, let's move on to you, thank you. Uh, so just a minute, something is wrong. Okay, we ah. can see it now. Yeah, yeah you can share. Oh, thank thank you. you. Sorry. Uh, no, so good morning all. Uh, sorry for this delay. Uh, I will be uh, presenting my work, which I would like to thank for the opportunity to present. It's about the anti-aging and neuroprotective effects of uh, uh, and hydroethanolic extract of Timus carnosus. Timus carnosus is an endemic plant from the Iberian Peninsula. It can be found in uh, some populations within uh, Portugal and uh, Spain, south coast, and also in Portugal, southwest coast. And due to its restricted location, uh, it has been listed as an endangered species as it can only be found in uh, natural parks and natural reserves. Apart from this, it can also be found in some collections uh, in uh, Utad's Botanical Garden um, that uh, were the location where we harvest uh, our plant for this, um, for this uh, study. So, um, for the methodologies, as usual for aromatic and medicinal plants, we uh, selected uh, the aer aerial parts that were grounded and leoph leophilized and grounded and were then used for um, the, the extraction procedure. We performed two extract procedures. One, a neck was extract, mimicking the human consumption as either an infusion, teas, uh, or as a condiment in food through the boiling process. And also, an exhaustive hydroethanolic extraction method using 80% ethanol that, we're aiming, that we were aiming to extract 100% of the phytochemicals present uh, in our uh, plant material. So both our extracts were analyzed by HPLC, both DAD and mass spectrometry, resulting in chromatograms as we see here uh, in this image. Apart from normal uh, compounds that we can find in um, aromatic plants within the thyme uh, genus uh, as uh, glycosidic uh, derivatives of some flavonoids as luteolin or apigenin. Um, the main uh, core of our extract was composed of phenolic acids, namely uh, newer compounds as salvinolic acid A, a new isomer of this acid uh, name, we named salvinolic isomer A, uh, that was the phenolic acid present in higher content in our extracts, also commonly found rosmarinic acid and salvinolic acid K with high content within this uh, plant extracts. We verified that uh, extract dependent concentration was obtained due to the effects of the, the ethanol in the hydroethanolic extracts and also the use of ethanol allowed us to extract another class of compounds uh, two pentacyclic triterpenoids, ursolic acid and donal oleanolic acid. Uh, ursolic acid was the compound present in higher amounts in our uh, extract, in both of them, uh, in uh, the hydroethanolic extract, sorry. So, uh, regarding this plant, due to previous studies, we already know that it had uh, antioxidant activity, uh, performed well against uh, several human uh, carcinogenic cell lines, uh, and showing it anti-proliferative activity and also some anti-inflammatory activity. And we, uh, the, our study was to uh, evaluate its effects in anti-aging and neuroprotective activity since other time species, as for example, Timus plugioides, had shown great results uh, in this type of bioactivities. So we choose to evaluate three enzymes, acylcholinesterase, tyrosinase and elastase, Acetylcholinesterase and tyrosinase were chosen for the uh, neuroprotective activity due to the involvement in uh, metabolic pathways related to neurodegenerative diseases as Parkinson and Alzheimer. 
and also tyrosinase and this time melastase for uh, their effects in anti-aging activity due to the relation to uh, metabolic process within the skin. What we observed was that uh, both extracts greatly inhibited uh, acetylcholinesterase activity, higher uh, inhibition for the hydroethanolic extract, most likely due to the higher content of uh, phytochemical uh, phenolic acids, flavonoids, and the pentacyclic triterpenoids, and uh, selective inhibition of elastase and tyrosinase was observed. Only aqueous extract inhibited uh, tyrosinase, and only the hydroethanolic extract inhibited elastase. In order to correlate these findings to our uh, phytochemical composition, we selected three of the major compounds that were available as commercial standards, rosmarinic acid, ursolic acid, and polyenolic acid, that we see that in acetylcholinesterase inhibition, as expected, uh, three of the, the, the three compounds uh, presented inhibition concerning this enzyme, uh, also correlating, correlating to the, the results we obtained for the extract since the hydroethanolic extract uh, presented higher inhibition and only the hydroethanolic extract uh, had ursolic and oleanolic acid. Regarding tyrosinase, none of the compounds at the tested concentrations um, presented inhibition. Once again, correlating to the results, since uh, in, if these compounds would present uh, some inhibition, then hydroethanolic extract would have higher contents and therefore a higher inhibition. And uh, all the standards inhibited elastase activity, once again showing uh, correlation with our results, since uh, most likely the concentration within aqueous extract of rosmarinic acid is not enough to produce an inhibition. And since uh, we uh, only have the, the triterpenoids in the retinolic acid, uh, only there the, the inhibition was observed. And so, as conclusions, um, we showed that our extracts have a potential for neuroprotective activity. Um, an extract composition dependent inhibition uh, of both elastase and tyrosinase was observed and correlated with the, com the phytochemical composition. And once again, we highlighted the potential of Timus carnosus as a source of functional foods and also as a source of nutraceutical compounds. I would like to thank FCT for the funding to both the research centers and my PhD grants. Uh, to the laboratories where I conduct my research and, of course, my supervisors. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you for your presentation. As uh, I was saying, let's leave the questions for the end of the session. So I will invite you to be with us until the end of your, of your session. Of uh, uh, just a, just a, a quick note, not for you, but for everyone, for the participants. I'm sorry, Carlos. If someone has problems in entering the Congress website, um, please uh, use another navigator, especially for the Mac users. We were told that uh, some of you have uh, problems in entering the page website. So let's move on for the third uh, presentation of this session uh, with Carlos uh, Shareishi. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Carlos. Um, yes, uh, good morning. Carlos will present uh, the work entitled Anti-Inflammatory Evaluation of a Leap of Natural Compounds Identified in Mushrooms Using in Silico Studies Against COX Enzymes. So, Carlos, let's move on to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. It's a pleasure. My name is Carlos. Uh, it's a pleasure to present my, my research in this Congress. Intitulated Anti-Inflammatory Evaluation of a library of natural compounds identified in mushrooms using in silico studies against COX enzymes. Ciclooxygenase COX-1 is a protein present in physiological COX-1 and inflammatory COX-2 process. COX-1 uh, participates, COX, sorry, participates in the metabolism of arachidonic acid, acting first in oxidation and later on reduction, converting arachidonic acid in prostaglandin G2. Protein COX-1 and 2 are the target of inhibition for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for the treatment of diseases. NSAIDs, there are some examples of NSAIDs. 
mefenic acid, aspirin, ibuprofen, and ethorcoxib. So, N6 is have, uh, using for treatment of diseases, asthma, cardiovascular, colorectal cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, osteoarthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. So, use for a long time, cause adverse effects. According for European medicines agency, such as gastrointestinal, renal, and cardiovascular problems. So, need alternative to compounds. Therefore, it is necessary to identify new molecular entities that act by inhibition COX-1 and 2. Or, according to Wuller, there is a cush approximately 1.8 billion to introduce a new drug on the market. Therefore, computational tools are important in the development of drugs to assist in the screening of compounds. This research increased and prepared the compound delivery from 115 to 190 mushroom compounds and identified the best one with COX inhibitory potential. Performed the spiritual screen study, pharmacokinetic, docking, and molecular dynamics. This present methodology is identified proteins in protein data bank database and evaluation their quality, identify molecules with medicinal potential from mushroom available in the literature, design and or preparation ligands and proteins in PDBQT format, evaluation of the best software, autodoc tools, or autodoc vina, automation of the docking process with MOLA software using Swiss Admin Server for obtaining pharmacokinetic data and this mount software to perform molecular dynamics. My materials is my computer, a nitro spin, and let's go to the results. The expansion of the library 3.0 was a success. The library is composed to 190 and the family's compound consists of 43% terpenes, 40 steroids, and other compounds, isoflavones, flavones, catecoides, phenols, quinones, and others. So, the LMW library, 3.0 library, has a satisfactory pharmacinetic profile, according to Swiss Admin Server, with evaluates the pharmacinetic parameters or admit absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity. Vina was identified as the best software for COX simulation. Performed a satisfactory forecast comparative to experimental result to constant inhibition. Virtual screening was performed. The factory compounds for molecular docking, the compounds origin A from the Neonotophanus nambu, mushroom, present in inhibition constant 152.4 nanomolar, and clavilactone C from the Cytosib clavipus mushroom had a high light inhibition against COX-2 of 52.3 nanomolar. And compound of simalonic B is having interaction with the two proteins, COX-1 and 2, Provenient from Fomitopsis officina officinalis. So, pharmacokinetic prediction, the factory compounds receive a good drug likeness profile, according to Swiss Admin Server. The dynamic simulation for clavilactone C has the best key value, satisfactory pharmacokinetic profile, and was verified via molecular dynamics, is stability within protein. The molecule does not diffuse from the protein in over time 10 nanoseconds. Conclusion, in general, terpenes were very light against the enzymes COX-1 and 2 from the docking studies performed using autodoc vina software. Autodizine A, terpene, produced the lowest predict key value against COX-1 and clavilactone C, with COX-2. Clavilactone C showed stability within the COX-2 through molecular dynamic simulation for 10 nanoseconds. 
when both COX enzymes were considered, oxymalonic B provides the best profile for dual COX inhibition, COX-1 and 2. So the three related compounds maybe have anti-inflammatory potential, having as mechanism of action the inhibition of COX-1 and or 2. However, experimental verification must be performed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, for your uh, nice presentation, quick presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you, two times. So we will uh, gather the questions until the end of the session. So uh, keep, uh, let's keep you with us and we will talk in a minute, okay? Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the presentation by Clara Grosso. Good morning, Clara. Good morning, she's with us already. Uh, Clara will talk uh, with us about silver brain, neuroprotective potential of seaweeds, subcritical water extract. So Clara, let's move on to you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to present our results in the project Silver Brain. This is a project, uh, a collaborative project between researchers from Requint in ITZEP and Faculty of Science and Technology, and also researchers from IBET. In this project, we try to take advantage of the biggest and the richest um, uh, number of seaweeds uh, distributed worldwide, which are rich in several metabolites. And we try to, to think about what about search for new uh, neuroprotective drugs that could be very useful and beneficial for people with um, ages uh, uh, over 65 years old and to contribute to active aging. However, uh, um, working with seaweeds, it's not easy because we have to take uh, into account several associated problems. First, we have to think that waters where they are uh, produced in aquaculture or they are naturally occurring can uh, contain uh, contaminants, environmental contaminants, such as pharmaceuticals, pesticides, and heavy metals. And also some seaweeds are very rich in iodine and their contents must, uh, can be very high and can disrupt uh, thyroid and contribute to the development of thyroid disorders. Moreover, uh, preparing uh, extracts is also another uh, issue that we must to take into account that are the solvent residues. And therefore, in order to uh, overcome this last problem, we opted by a green technology to extract the biotiff compounds, which was the supercritical water extraction. We performed the, the extraction in a temperature gradient mode in order to obtain with the same raw material several fractions from room temperature to 250 degrees. The experimental outline uh, were grouped in three main parts. First, we tried to access the presence or the absence of, the, of several environmental contaminants, uh, which included pharmaceutical pesticides and also their transformation products and metabolites by LCNS, and also some uh, one heavy metal and iodine content by ECPNS. Concerning the extracts, the the bioactivities and the chemical composition. We target our investigations for um, right now for spectrophotometric methods to access the chemical composition, but we hope that in future we can go further for LCMES analysis and some in future bioactivities targeting the extra oxidative stress and also enzymes involved in, the, in several neurodegenerative and psychiatric diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and depression. Concerning the uh, assessment of the, uh, the presence or absence of contaminants, we were glad to, to see that all the extracts were free of pharmaceuticals and pesticides. However, uh, they have uh, a problem of high amounts of iodine and arsenic. As you can see by the graphics, in the first steps at 19 degrees and 140 degrees, um, there are a, a high amount of iodine and arsenic that are leached. I would like to call your attention that uh, as long as the extraction pro uh, progress 
the, the amounts are even less and less and less. But uh, in, in, the, in the case of the arsenic uh, content, I would like to call your attention that in the first steps, the kind of uh, arsenic that is leached is the inorganic one, which is the more toxic one. So we cannot use the first and second step of the extraction for further assays. And then in, at 119 degrees, in the case of Fucus vesiculosus, we can say that there's a, a little bit more arsenic that are leached, but it is the organic fraction, which is less harmful. So uh, taking all these results into account, we decide to go further for the bioactivity assessment with just the uh, step three and step four of the extraction. For both uh, seaweeds, the Fucus vesiculosus, that is a brown seaweed, and Codytomentosus, that is a green seaweed. Concerning the bioactivities, uh, in the case of the antioxidant activity, you can see that the lowest IC50 value, which means the concentration that inhibits the radicals or the, the antioxidant activity uh, in 50%, for the um, superoxide radical and for the nitric oxide radical, we can see that the extract, the more active fractions are the ones that were obtained in the last step of the extraction at 250 degrees. Therefore, we decided to uh, go into more activities to see if they are very, they are beneficial for neuroprotective activities and then we tested all only the fraction three and four of these two, by the two seaweeds in several uh, enzyme assays. As you can see, for the acetylcholinesterase inhibition and butyrylcholinesterase inhibition, that are enzymes involved in Alzheimer's disease, only the um, extract of uh, codiotomatose obtained at 250 degrees were active. And the same for the other enzymes the fourth step was all, were all, always the most active one. So we decided to go look and, and see what kind of chemi uh, chemical composition was um, um, due to, uh, these bioactivities were due to which kind of chemical compounds. And as you can see, the um, phenolic compounds that are the most widespread uh, compounds in seaweed extracts, you can see that uh, they are decreasing from step one to step four in the case of Fucus vesiculosus, but there are a little bit increase in the codiotomentoso uh, case. But we have to take in account that there are several interference in the Falancio Calto test, so we need to, to, to see these results with uh, some caution. And the same for the total uh, total fl uh, flavonoid content and uh, fluorotenin content that is decreasing along the extraction. So we decided to see in the literature what kind of compounds could contribute to the bioactivities at 250 degrees. And we came across with the uh, Maillard reaction that is well described in the supercritical uh, subcritical water extraction processes because it takes a uh, high, high temperature and um, it, uh, it results from the reaction of reducing sugars and amino acids that we could see that are increasing from step one to step four in our extractions. As you can see, the colorless, colorless intermediates uh, my reaction products, the yellow... Uh, Clara, Clara yes. uh, two minutes, okay? Yes, two yes. The, the yellow ones and the brown ones are always increasing uh, along the, the, the extraction and they can contribute to the bioactivities because they are already reported as antioxidant um, compounds. Therefore, we can conclude that the supercritical food, uh, super, uh, subcritical water extraction is a very versatile uh, technique to obtain several fractions from the same raw material. Uh, they can eliminate from step one to step four high amounts of heavy metals and iodine, 
And at the same time, we, we can obtain extracts with good activity in terms of antioxidant and neuroprotective effects. And these bioactivities can be a combination of a low amount of phenolic compounds and a high amount of Maillard reaction products. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to, to present the results and to all the financial institutions and all the researchers that contributed to these results. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Clara, uh, for your talk, for your wonderful presentation. Let's move on to Katia, Katia Kramberger presentation. We will ask you the questions in the final session. Okay, Clara. So Katia Kramberger will present the work in Titan entitled Elicrisium Italicum, Italicum Infusion Stimulates Energy Expenditure and Fat Oxidation After Acute Ingestion in Humans, a pilot study. Katia, hello, good morning, uh, let's move on to you. Clara, please um, stop sharing the... Um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yes. thank you. So Katia, let's move on to you, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, just a second. Okay, uh, so uh, yes, I will present to you um, a pilot study with Helichrysum Italicum uh, that we conducted on healthy male uh, volunteers. Uh, the study was performed by our research group at the Department of Nutritional Counseling uh, within the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Primorska. Uh, we are located at the coastal region uh, of Slovenia, and our research is mainly focused on um, Mediterranean plants and uh, functional uh, foods in general. Uh, but lately, our focus is mainly on uh, helichrysum, which is also a topic of my PhD uh, work. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this plant. It is uh, characteristic of Mediterranean region. Uh, it can be uh, recognized by its yellow fate resistant inflorescences, uh, which are uh, rich in uh, bioactive secondary metabolites. Um, uh, and these um, bioactive compounds, compounds are synthesized uh, as a result of adaptation uh, to this demanding environment. Pro uh, apart from volatile terpenes, uh, which are mainly present in, in the essential oil, the plant is also rich in phenolic compounds, uh, which are rather polar compounds uh, and also uh, well-known antioxidants. Uh, due to uh, its um, rich uh, biochemical profile, Helichrysum italicum uh, possesses uh, many promising pharmacological activities. Uh, this plant uh, has been traditionally used uh, for respiratory infections, uh, digestive problems, and for inflammatory skin conditions. Uh, uh, it, but it has been also uh, investigated uh, scientifically, both uh, in vitro as in vivo, uh, but mainly on um, single isolated compounds. Uh, therefore, we wanted to uh, investigate whole plant water extracts, so-called infusions, which are um, may often used in uh, traditional medicine. Our aim was to explore acute effects of uh, helichrysum italicum uh, infusions on uh, resting uh, metabolic rate and possible uh, subs uh, substrate uh, differences in substrate oxidation in uh, healthy male subjects. Um, we also performed um, additional um, uh, in vitro experiments uh, to further investigate the mechanism of action of uh, helichrysum uh, infusion. Um, an infusion was prepared by uh, immersing one gram of um, helichrysum in uh, boiling water for 10 minutes 
and then um, 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 chemical composition was determined as well. Um, and for the pilot study, 11 male adults were divided into uh, two groups uh, and assigned to either um, bioactive beverage or a placebo beverage, which was uh, just a hot water. And then to the, uh, another, to the other beverage after seven days uh, of the washout period. Um, metabolic rate and substrate oxidation uh, were measured by uh, indirect calorimetry um, at uh, pre-ingestion. This was at the baseline. Uh, and um, after 30 and 120 minutes uh, post-ingestion. And for the gene expression analysis, uh, RNA was isolated from infusion-treated um, and control hepatocytes uh, and we used um, hep G2 cell line for this purpose. Um, we identified various uh, um, chemical uh, compound classes, uh, among which um, capillokinic acids were the most abundant uh, and uh, followed by pyrons and flavanols. Um, using calorimetry measurements, we, um, um, we found that uh, a single uh, ingestion of helichrysum uh, infusion uh, um, caused a um, slight but a significant increase in energy expenditure uh, in healthy male um, subjects uh, compared to the placebo beverage. Uh, as well as a decrease in uh, respiratory quotient after 30 minutes and still after 120 minutes uh, post-ingestion. Uh, a similar trend was also observed for um, fatty, uh, fatty ox fat oxidation, uh, uh, we, uh, which was also increased um, after, uh, compared to the placebo. Uh, however, um, no uh, significant change was observed for the blood pressure over time, uh, except for the, um, for the diastolic blood pressure um, at the 30 minutes post-ingestion. Um, um, uh, the same effect um, was uh, also observed, um, uh, confirmed in in vitro experiments um, regarding fat oxidation, uh, where we found um, an upregulation of fatty acid genes, um, uh, genes responsible for fatty acid oxidation, uh, such as uh, CPT1 and CPT2, uh, and also a downregulation of ACC gene. Uh, which is involved in uh, fatty acid synthesis. However, um, no uh, significant change was observed for DGAT, uh, which occurs uh, as the terminal, um, in the terminal step of um, triglyceride synthesis. Um, with the present study, uh, we have gained some uh, insight into uh, the activity of helichrysum italicum uh, in humans, which was very scarce before. Um, we have shown that um, he uh, helichrysum italicum infusion um, stimulates both resting energy expenditure and fat, fat oxidation in normal weight men, uh, which was uh, also confirmed in um, vitro uh, on molecular level. Um, this poses a possibility that consumption of helichrysum italicum may have a beneficial effect on an individual's ability to maintain uh, lower body fat levels. Um, however, uh, further um, studies um, under pathophysiological conditions and uh, in long-term use are necessary to um, draw more 
a solid conclusions. Um, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Katya. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Let's leave again as your as your colleagues uh, the questions until the end of the session and move on for the last presentation of this session by Teresa Braz. Hello, Teresa, good morning. Uh, Teresa will talk uh, with us about Kituzan based films loaded with Sinaro Picrin enriched extract from Sinara Cardunculus anti inflammatory potential. So, Teresa, let's move on to you. Thank you. So good morning. As was already said, my presentation is about, about the chitosan-based films loaded with, with sinaropicrine enriched extracts from Sinara cardunculus and the assessment of its anti-inflammatory potential. <clears throat> okay. Ah, okay. But first, let me talk to you about cisquiterpene lactones group that for sure are familiar for most of you and comprises over 5,000 known compounds. Cisketerpene lactones are considered one of the most prevalent and biologically significant group of secondary metabolites with described biological activities such as antitumoral, antimicrobial, antimalarial, anti-inflammatory um, uh, activities, among others. And for that, they are considered a valuable resource in terms of health applications. Besides having a good amount of biomass production that can range it from 7.8 to 20 tons by weight per hectare, Sinara cardunculus is also a great source of cisketerpene lactone, and for that was selected to be used as a case study in this project. As observed by Ramos et al. during the lipophilic fraction characterization of Sinara cardunculus uh, leaves extract, uh, cisketerpene lactones may have a content near to 95 grams per kilogram of dry weight. And from the ones identified, Sinaropicrine was considered the, the one in major quantities with almost 87 grams per kilogram of dry weight. Several studies as focus on Sinaropicrine high biological potential where anti-inflammatory potential is of particular interest when thinking in terms of wound dressing applications. Since extensive inflammation plays a major role in the disruption of normal healing cascade, presenting a significant psychological, physical, and financial burden for patients. When compared to systemic delivery, localized drug delivery systems may reduce undesired side effects such as toxicity, toxicity and suboptimal uh, delivery. Besides, they provide spatial temporal control over the drug dosage. <coughs> that, sorry directly at the home site and protects and also protects the drugs from metabolic deactivation and maintains the drug concentration at the desired level. Nevertheless, an appropriate and immediate coverage of the wound area when adequate dressing is essential for wound protection in order to accelerate wound healing. And in a constant need to improve patients' lives and decrease ambulatory costs, in the last two decades, efforts have been made toward the design of new wound dressings with the incorporation of biotin materials such as chitosan, regarded one of the most promising materials for wound dressings due to its unique properties. That can be improved by incorporation of bioactive compounds such as sinaropicrine, that in combination with its anti-inflammatory potential may lead to an enhanced wound healing. And from that, the global aim of this work was the design and production of sinaropicrine from Sinarda cardunculus and leaves, uh, enriched leaves extracts and its application on a chitosan matrix as a wound dressing for anti-inflammatory drug delivery. On what concerns to the, the film development, they were developed by the solvents evaporation method where chitosan membranes were loaded with different extract concentration and obtaining dense and thermal stable membranes. In what concerns to the mechanical properties, namely the puncture stress, the films produced presented a lower mechanical resistance when compared to the control one, what was mainly attributed to the presence of hydrophobic compounds such as sinaropicrine, and also to the molecular interactions between the extract and chitosan, leading to the weakness on the polymer chain aggregation forces. Nevertheless, the produced films were still able to be applied as a wound dressing since the human skin, uh, human skin tensile strength is located between 5 and 30 megapascals. The swelling effect was also evaluated and also a decrease on the film swelling capacity was observed with increasing extract concentration, 
what was assumed to be correlated to the decrease of the polymer hydrophilicity, leading to a lower swelling ability. This lower swelling ability indicates that developed films are suitable to be used on light exudate homes. According to the International Standard Guidelines for Biological Evaluation of Medical Devices, a cell viability reduction higher than 30% is considered to present cytotoxic effect. And the analysis of the results for, that, uh, for the cell viability assay using the BJ cell line indicated that the films with 1% and 5% extract were not considered cytotoxic, with toxicity highly correlated to the sinuropicrine extract content. With IL-6 as one of the key pro-inflammatory factors produced by dermofibroblasts in response to certain stimuli, normal human skin fibroblasts were stimulated using liposaccharides from E. coli and exposed to film extracts in order to understand the film anti-inflammatory potential. And the results reveal that a slightly decrease with the lower extract content was observed and the strongest effect was observed for the 5% extract with, re with a reduction of 86% um, and 83% in the IL-6 expression by skin fibroblasts comparatively to the stimulated uh, cells and also to the ones uh, exposed to the, the commercial anti-inflammatory pyroxicum. When comparing the IL-6 effect of the extract and the sinuropicrine standard, a more potent anti-inflammatory was observed for the extract comparatively to the sinuropicrine. These results disclose the potential to, be, to, the, to the extract to be used as a home dressing uh, for chronic homes. To conclude, uh, at the end of this work, it was possible to conclude that uh, to observe uh, that a decrease of the volumetric swelling capacity was observed with the extract loading. What could be adva advantages for home dressings where an excessive fluid sorption is not desired? Also, a decrease on the tensile strength with the extract loading was observed, although still inside of the skin parameters. The film loaded with 10% extract presented cytotoxic effect to the BJ fibroblast cell line, what was correlated to the sinuropicrine content. On what concerns to the IL-6 levels on the LPS-stimulated skin fibroblasts, the film with chitosan and chitosan loaded with 1% presented the same effect obtained with pyrox commercial, pyroxicum, commercial anti inflammatory pyroxicum. The film, uh, on the other side, the film with 5% percent present, uh, percent extract presented a significant reduction on the IL-6 levels, showing its potential for chronic wound management. To finish, I would like to thank to, re to the research and uh, to, to the research institutions, to the funding uh, institution, the Faculdade de Ciência e Tecnologia, and to the funding projects, Val Biotech Sinara, Medicinara Biotech, and also to all the research team, and to you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and fast presentation. Thank mm. you for that. Uh, let's move on now for a little session of questions. I have here three questions and no more. We do not have time for more also. The first question is for Anna Serra. So Anna, are you listening to me? Or I don't know if Anna is here. Yes. Yes, okay. Anna, uh, the question that I have here for you is, uh, are there already in the market some natural based medicines for the purposes of your study? Did you were, or you were able to compare results in terms of efficacy with your natural products? Uh, so, uh, well, um, in the case of hydroxytyrosol, for instance, there are already, already companies that are selling the compound isolated for, for uh, food and for cosmetic applications. Uh, and well, concerning uh, um, the the use of this type of of this type of compo compounds for cancer, well, this is uh, um, uh, this is uh, well not uh, this is 
this is uh, well, uh, this is not uh, uh, regula regulated uh, well, mm -hmm. and yes. uh, there are the the claims that are already um, uh, reported uh, f uh, in the EFSA. Well, uh, are more related with cardiovascular diseases mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, metabolic diseases. Uh, mm -hmm. So for cancer, it is it is. It's quite difficult. difficult to, yes, yes, of course, of course. So uh, regulation, regulation is the next step yes. for yes. for your study, yes. and we hope that uh, all of this is towards that uh, that path. Thank you again, Teresa. Uh, another question that I have for Carlos Shiraishi. Hello, Carlos. Can you listen to me? It's a question for from Marcio Carosho. Uh, he says that, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, I saw you use Autodoc Vina for the docking studies. Any specific reason for using that one? And did you try any other docking program to compare your results? Uh, I compared my results with the experimental uh, values disponible, disponible in Pit Protein Data Bank. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using protein, uh, in, uh, pro in, in inhibition protein, uh, mm -hmm. and and realized the the cross docking. Uh, I mean, I'm validating my simulation in this mo this mode. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you again, Carlos. Um, the last question is for Katia. Katia Kramberger. Yes. Know, yes. Hello, Katia. Uh, the question that I have for you is: um, Did you ever thought on using other type of prep, uh, preparation extracts besides infusion? Do you think that the infusion extract is the best one to obtain the amount of bioactive compounds that you need to to see the health uh, effects that you want? Um. Our primary goal was to um, use such an pre such preparation that is um, the most suitable um, for the consumption in humans. Mm -hmm. As and um, we um, looked up um, for the preparation that are uh, mainly used in uh, traditional medicine, and uh, then uh, there the most common ones are mm -hmm. um, infusions or decoctions. Um, yes. Uh, namely, uh, some water-based preparations that are easily to prepare, uh, easily prepared. Um, so uh, yes, um, that's why we used uh, this one. Um, but also, um, in our previous study, when uh, where we investigated um, uh, chemical composition of um, helichrysum in general. Mm -hmm. Helichrysum italicum in general, we also used um, ethanolic extracts and methanolic extracts. Um, these are um, somehow richer in, um, of course, richer in um, phenolic Bio compounds, yeah. phenolic, yeah. but um, are not so appropriate for ingestion. For ethanolic, yes, yeah. but methanolic, definitely. No, no, it's a question of safety and the yes, final purpose yes. of, your, of your extract. So, Thank you, Katya, for your uh, answer. Thank you all again for your wonderful presentations. Thank you again for uh, Anna, Dr. Anna Barros for the invited lecture that she gave us to us. And let's move on to the pitch section, session um, and the last session of, the, of this morning. So uh, I will now pass the word to my colleague, Philippe Reis, that will moderate the next session. Thank you all and good morning. Thank you, Ines. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we will continue uh, with our participants communication session. Uh, we will present us uh, the main results uh, of their research in developing and applying natural products in the health area. Uh, let's start with the pitch sessions. Uh, I want to remind the audience that you can follow uh, the conference's live streaming on YouTube's IPB channel. You can follow the communications uh, and you can send your own questions uh, through the chat. And after selection, uh, I will present those questions uh, to our speakers. Uh, 
Uh, you can also uh, download, it, uh, download the posters available online. You will find on the conference website uh, three links corresponding to the three areas covered in this Congress, health, food and cosmetics. Uh, regarding the pitch sessions, um, I inform our speakers that they have three minutes to make uh, their presentations. Uh, there will be no interruption uh, between uh, the presentations and only at the end, uh, we will open a space for questions. Um, to not cause uh, major delays uh, for this uh, pitch session, uh, we will allow you to ask only one or two questions. Uh, the remaining questions could be sent by email, okay? So let's move on. Uh, and uh, Ana Sofia Pereira de Freitas will start the session. Ana, you can start your presentation. You have the floor. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ana. I'm a PhD student from the University of Minho, Portugal, and I will present a part of my work regarding the antibacterial and antioxidant synergies between propolis and gentamicin or honey. Since the first case of bacterial infection with resistance in 2008, antimicrobial resistance has become an emergent problem causing a prediction of 10 million deaths globally by 2050. The overuse of antibiotics, their extensive use in farming practices, their patients' misuse, along with the lack of new antibiotics, are contributing factors to this problem. So there is a need for strategies to overcome the microbial resistance and development of new antimicrobial drugs. Interest in natural products has been increasing due to their spectrum of bioactivities that can be used for the development of new drugs, to retard the outbreak of bacterial resistance, to decrease a bacterial resistance impacts. So propolis is a natural product produced by bees from several plant materials and mixed with their salivary enzymes. So after the determination of the minimum inhibitory concentrations for both gentamicin and the ethanol extracts of propolis, by the agar dilution method, several mixtures of submic concentrations of both agents were tested in order to find synergism. So, as you can see in, in this table, with a submic of 25 micrograms per milliliter of propolis, it was possible to reduce to 25 times less the amount of gentamicin initially needed um, to inhibit the growth of bacillus strains. Also first, the Philococcus aureus methicillin sensitive and resistant strains and for E. coli, it was possible a reduction of 70% of the amount of gentamicin initially needed to inhibit bacterial growth. Regarding propolis and honey synergies, the higher the percentage of honey in the mixture, the lower the antioxidant capacity. However, with the exception for bacillus cereus, all the mixtures of submic concentrations of propolis and honey show a strong antibacterial activity than each individual sample. With particular interest for these strains, where it was found a huge reduction of the amount of both agents. So, this outcome is significant considering the worldwide problem of antibiotic resistance and the need to innovate in antibiotic therapy, in particular of if solutions from natural sources, such as propolis and honey, are envisaged. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you so much. Now we are moving on to André, uh, André Folgado. Uh, you may uh, present uh, your poster your pitch session, please. Yes, uh, so you are hearing me? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Indra Folgada and today I'm going to talk to you about air root cultures of Sinera carduncles as a valuable source of hydroxycinamic acid compounds. So as you already uh, heard, cardoon is a, is a plant widely studied regarding their secondary metabolites. The upper parts of the plant already showed some important uh, met, uh, secondary metabolites. 
Although, although this is true for the, the, the above ground part of the plant, the underground part of the plant still remain pretty much uh, unstudied. To address this question uh, and this issue, we use the root cultures. So these root cultures are the result of agrobacterium chrysogenes infection. These are characterized by a high growth rate and also high branching. They uh, are important because they produce the same uh, secondary metabolites as the source plant and they are characterized by a high genetic stability, which give this a high potential for biotechnological applications. So we, we for the induction of the air roots from cardum, we infected hypocotyls from cardum, and after we, we, uh, we uh, had the, the air roots, we perform air root uh, methanolic extract, and we analyze this extract by HPLC MS, and we detect uh, several compounds, although this mixture uh, showed low complexity. So uh, uh, the, the peaks are very well uh, resolved. Uh, so three of them we were confirmed by standard and the rest of the peaks were confirmed by comparison with the literature. Uh, all of these compounds uh, belong to the hydroxycinamic acid, uh, acid group and all of them are chlorogenic acid derivatives. Uh, then uh, we analyzed these uh, cultures uh, 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 in, the, in their growth uh, curve, and uh, we analyzed them in, in terms of total phenolic content that increases along the, the growth curve of the, the root cultures. And the same pattern is true for the antioxidant activity, reaching its highest value at the 35th day of the, the growth curve. So we use this a time point to produce an ext and a concentrated extract that was further used uh, in uh, to test antiproliferative activity on human colorectal cell lines, HT29 cells, um, that presented uh, an EC50 at 1.16 milligrams per milliliter. The same uh, concentration uh, showed no uh, effect on uh, cells that mimic the intestine, uh, intestinal uh, epithelium uh, cells, uh, human cells. Uh, so with this, I thank you and I finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, André. Um, now, uh, Bruna Mara Machado Ribeiro will present uh, her pitch. Bruna? Good morning. Okay. Okay. My, okay. My name is Bruna Mara Machado Ribeiro. I'm from Brazil, work as scientific research. My line is neuropharmacologic, neuroinflammation, neuroprotection, and neuroimmune activation. My studies detect the inflammatory effect of any three polysaturated fatty acids on virus effect neurons. The viral image poly IC is important to, to study the consequences of viral infection to the development of neuropsychiatric disorders. Based on the premise of omega-3 presents anti-inflammatory effect, whereas investigate the involvement of NF kappa B, pathway the effects of omega-3 in compound neurons exposed to the polycell virus. Poly-IC is a synthetic immunostimulation virus. Poly-IC induced by microglial activation. Poly-IC increased to two levels in, in us, nf kappa b P5, P65, ELIC, nitrites, and hippocal neuronal cells. Poly-IC causes deficits in neuronal hippocampal mechanism. Omega-3 prevent neuroinflammation alterations in those leads for value poly IC. Omega-3 prevent the deficits of BDNF. Omega-3 increases DCX immune expression. Omega-3 presents effect anti-inflammatory. Poly C induces microglia activation. Poly C induces increases the levels of NF kappa B P15, NF kappa B P65, omega 3 effect anti neuroinflammatory, effects neuroprotective omega 3 in neuronal cellulose, 
MTT increased, neuroprotective effects omega-3 impede peroxidation, omega-3 suppresses the expression of P15, C5, and f kappa b sub neuroprotective efforts of omega-3 in NOS, neuroprotective efforts omega-3 in P15, nf kappa b in NOS, co-immune stent, in primary in pocapo neuros, neuroprotective efforts omega-3 in P65, nf kappa b, protein express in primary in pocapo neurons, changely, Neuroprotect effects omega-3 in terleucina 6 levels in primary hippocampus neurotangents, follow policy. Neuroprotect effect of omega-3 in it reach levels in primary hippocampus neurons. Omega-3 prevent the deficits BDNF in cellulose. Omega-3 increases the CGX immune expression. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Bruna. Uh, now I call uh, Catarina Faria Silva uh, Hi. to make her presentation. Good morning, Catarina. I will share my here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Perfectly. So good morning. I'm Catarina Silva from Faculty of Pharmacy of the University of Lisbon. And today I will tell you about the extraction of alpha tomatine from green tomatoes industrial waste to treat skin inflammatory diseases. Starting with uh, green tomatoes. During the tomatoes harvest, uh, many of them are still green and they are thrown back to the fields, being an industrial waste. Um, furthermore, it is known that the um, green tomatoes are rich in glycoalkaloids, namely alpha tomatine. And this glycoalkaloid was already studied in its pure form by several research groups. And they found out that it possessed several activities namely anti-inflammatory, fungicide, anti-carcinogenic activity. So what we are proposing here is to establish a sustainable and circular economy where we are going to take the industrial waste of green tomatoes, extract the alpha tomatine through an environmentally friendly method, the subcritical water, and then we are going to incorporate the alpha tomatine in a topical formulation to treat the skin inflammatory diseases. The extraction, this thermodynamical process is a very important part of this work because we want to assure that the process is as green and sustainable as possible. And so critical water basically uses only water, high pressure and the tomatoes. We had to develop these methods, we tested several conditions and in the end we obtained an extract. To have a comparison, we also perform the extraction with conventional organic solvents with the method that is already described in the literature. However, the extract has all the components of the tomatoes. So in order to quantify the alpha tomatine, we need to do an additional purification step. So we perform solid phase extraction. And what we found out is that we when using the subcritical water extraction, we obtain 10 times more alpha tomatine than with conventional organic solvents. So what we are going to do next now is to do a characterization of the full composition of the extract. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katerina. Um, now we have Ala Adat. Hello. Hello, good morning. You can make your presentation. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello, my name is Hela, and uh, today I'm going to present a project titled by Optimization of New Anti-Inflammatory Methodologies to Evaluate Natural Product Activity as Inflammation Inhibitors. I'm going to start with the introduction and objective. Inflammation is a defense mechanism that is designed to eradicate microbes or irritants to protect living tissue from infections, injuries, and to potentiate tissue repair. The objective is to exploit Dengibir officinalis and Veronia dioica as promising anti-inflammatory agents. Methodology. We are going to use the hydroethanolic extract. 
uh, to evaluate the anti-inflammatory activity using mouse macrophage, uh, cytotoxic activity using four tumoral cell lines and one normal cell lines, and the cell cycle and apoptosis using flow cytometry. A result and discussion. Uh, the results are still preliminary and needs to be repeated. The anti-inflammatory activity, we are going to measure the EC50 value, which is correspond to the extract concentration achieving 50% of the inhibition of NO production. Uh, the, three sam uh, the two samples and uh, their combination present a really interesting value, and uh, the BD present a very low value, which is even lower than the positive control. Cytotoxic activity, uh, we are going to measure the GE50 value, which is correspond to the concentration of extract that inhibited 50% of cell growth. Uh, for uh, the officinalis, uh, the four cell lines present a low uh, GE50, uh, a lower GE50 uh, than, uh, the, than uh, the normal cell line, and the NCE present the lowest one. For uh, BD, uh, all the value of GE was lower than C, uh, was lower than uh, 6.25, uh, so we are going to repeat this test with the lower concentration. The cell cycle analysis shows that the Z officinalis had the same distribution, had the same cell distribution as the blind test, and the B joica has a really interesting increase in G0 and G1 phases, uh, so it does interfere with the cell cycle. The apoptosis analysis shows that uh, the BD had no apoptotic effect and uh, that the ginger, which caused a really interesting uh, decreased percentage of uh, dead cells, have an apoptotic effect which is confirmed to the literature. Conclusion. Given the well-known side effects of the commonly used synthetic anti-inflammatory agents, this preliminary study contributes to the discovery of natural agents as real alternatives and with less or no side effects. Veronia Dioica revealed the highest potential with the highest, highest anti-inflammatory activity and the higher effect on the cell, cell, cell cycle distribution. The chemical characterization in terms of phenolic compound profile is ongoing, and that's really interesting parameters, so we can know the relation between phenolic compound composition and the biologic activity. Thanks for your interest. Thank you, Ala. Uh, finally, I invite uh, Nayara Fernandez uh, to present her work. Nayara, good morning. Uh, is Nayara there? Yeah. Uh, we are not listening to you. You have your uh, Microphone. I'm really yeah. sorry. I'm already sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the delay. Okay. No so um, I'm Ayala Fernandez. I'm I work in nutraceuticals and bioactive process technology lab at IBET. And today I would like to show you a little bit about the industrial waste stream valorization that we are doing here at IBET. The competences in our food and health division includes the recovery of high added value compounds chemical and bioactivity characterization. And finally, if needed, we also do some uh, formulation for the addition of these ingredients in final products. We are used to, to work with different natural matrices, but today I will, I will present three case studies that are based on uh, wineries and fisheries waste streams. In this first case study, I would like to show you several terpene-based natural depotetic systems were synthesized. Uh, with the aim of recovering axtacentin from brown shell residues. Uh, so those systems were synthesized and um, physicochemically characterized, and they're applied for destruction of the, of the mentioned carotenoid. The results show that they were, uh, the results were comparable to the ones obtained with uh, conventional methodologies. And also they were applied to another uh, matrices such as microalgae and other seafood. Also, this uh, terpene-based uh, system and the extract obtained were uh, shown to be to have a good potential for anti-cancer and antimicrobial activity. Um, this, in this second uh, work that I would like to present to you, uh, we were able to extract phenolic and anthocyanin sorry, uh, compounds from winery waste streams. Uh, we were able to, to enhance the yield of the extraction, uh, applying a microwave pretreatment prior to the solid liquid extraction. And then those extracts were evaluated for their potential in, in for the possible potential in cosmetic, for cosmetic applications, sorry. 
they show high antioxidant activity, both in chemical and cell-based assays. And also several uh, enzymatic um, assays show that they had some effect in the skin aging. Finally, I would like to show you this cotton-like structure, the uh, fiber that was synthesized here uh, by supercritical drying of uh, gel that was formed by alginate and ketosan, both of them very abundant polymers in, in marine environments. So this uh, material showed to be non-cytotoxic and also showed to have a strong antimicrobial effect. Moreover, it stimulates the migration of skin cells. So overall, it was seen like a possible candidate to, to use in good healing uh, applications. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the conference uh, committee for allowing me doing this presentation. And please, if, as it was very fast, if you have any doubt or comment, please contact me by email and we can discuss further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nayara. Um, so, um... We have here um, one question. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, you all, uh, that uh, present your pitch. Uh, uh, all uh, were very uh, clear. Um, and I have here uh, a question sent by uh, Marcio, one of our participants. Um, he thanks Katerina for her presentation. Um, and. Uh, he thinks uh, it's a very nice idea. So Katerina, um, Marcio is asking, uh, why did you choose the subcritical water uh, to perform your work? Or, uh, and uh, why? And if you choose another one or tested another one? Well, like uh, I said, we compared with uh, organic, um, organic solvents that it's already used in describing the literature, but the subcritical water allows us to have what we, I show much, much more tomatine, alpha tomatine, and it's a green process, only uses green solvents. So it goes in line with the, the sustainable idea that we want to have in our final product. Okay, okay, thank you, Katerina. Um, since we are running late, um, I guess we will move on. I rem uh, remind all the participants that you can send uh, your questions uh, by uh, via email uh, for us and uh, then the speakers can answer you, okay? Uh, but since we already exceeded the scheduled time, I guess we uh, will move on, okay? So let's move on to the, to the morning's last presentation uh, in the health area, the keynote three. Uh, as for the previous sessions, uh, do not forget that you can follow the conferences live streaming on the IPB channel uh, on, the, on YouTube, uh, and you use the chat to place your questions. Um, I remind you that uh, you should send your questions during the presentation uh, and do not save them to the end as you may not receive them on time, and therefore we will not uh, present those questions to the speaker. So, uh, keynote three will be presented by Dr. Adlar Bracht from Maringa State University, who I am pleased to present uh, next. Uh, Dr. Adlar holds a PhD in Natural Sciences from the University of Munich and is currently a senior professor of biochemistry at the State University of Maringa. He has been doing research work since 1980 uh, focusing on liver metabolism, including oxidative stress. I welcome Dr. Adler and invite him to present his keynote entitled The Adjuvant-Induced Arthritis Model and its Utility for Investigating Anti-Inflammatory and Antioxidant Effects. Dr. Adler, welcome, and please, you have the floor. Thank you. You are hearing me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay. So... Let's move to the next. So there are many in vitro systems that allow a preliminary evaluation of these properties. In general, however, these characterizations are relatively uncertain because they are artificial conditions, which, which mostly have little or no resemblance to the in vivo conditions especially the effective doses and concentrations are frequently uncertain. 
These are the main reasons why in vivo models are in fact needed. These models represent an intermediate step that precedes the final goal to be reached, the clinical trial. The adjuvant induced R2D grants present several favorable features for being used as an in vivo model. First of all, several inflammatory oxidative and metabolic indicators are modified. Modifications are essential. This is because it is extremely difficult to improve conditions that are already close to normal. The modifications in these rats, these arthritic rats, are not restricted to the joints, but they usually become systemic and affect a lot of our organs and tissues. The modifications in these rats, furthermore, are very similar to the modifications that occur in rheumatoid arthritis. This is important because this generates a translation factor. So you can translate eventually these results to rheumatoid arthritis patients. Because in patients, in the actual patients, limited interven interventions are possible. You can obtain, for example, blood samples or eventually samples from other tissues. In the rat, however, all organs can be analyzed. So you will have a parameter diversification, which increases certainly the uh, importance of the results you are obtaining. In the rat, arthritis can be induced for example, by injecting the so-called adjuvant, which may consist of HIV inactivated mycobacterium tuberculosis, for example. If this adjuvant is injected, for example, in the left paw, an edema developed quite rapidly, which is evidenced by this poor volume increase that is observed here. Later on, the non-injected paw, in this case, the right hind paw, also develops these lesions. And in time, the disease becomes systemic, it extends to the whole body so that practically all organs or at least most important organs are in fact affected by the disease. This produces many changes that can be measured. These changes should be senti sensitive to anti-inflammatories or antioxidant agents. Here we see what happens in the liver, for example. This work was published a few years ago, in which we analyzed the changes in the liver cells. This work specifically, but it paid the scheme basis on several modifications that were detected by preceding work. As you can see, circulating cytokines induce several transformations, which include, for example, increase of the glycolysis because glucokinase is increased, decreases glucose phosphatase, which means also, which is in line with decreased gluconeogenesis, decreases in the NADPH, NAD ratio, which is connected with the decrease in GSH, GSSG, 
ratio. And all this leads to several modifications, which include increase in reactive oxygen species, which means increase in protein oxidation, increase in lipid peroxidation, and so on. There is also an increase in nitric oxide synthase, decrease in antioxidant enzymes, and so on. All these parameters can be measured. And potentially, antioxidants, natural antioxidants, should affect these, these parameters. That is an important fact that I would like to emphasize here. These effects are compartmentalized. You see here three compartments. We have distinguished these compartments, the cytosol, peroxisomes, and mitochondria. The effects may be different in these three compartments. Ideally, one should not analyze the whole cell contents, but it is more, would be more appropriate to analyze different compartments although this is linked to hard work and is rarely done, in fact. So this gives us a general picture of what happens in the liver. You see, all these parameters can be measured or should be measured when testing and, and the antioxidant effect of a given compound. Similar things happen in the cardiomyocyte. We have published this paper a few years ago. The effects are equally compartmentalized and may even be different depending on the parameter. For example, thiols are increased in the endoplasmic reticulum, but decrease decrease it in the endoplasmic reticulum, but increase it in the mitochondria. The extent of the effects may be different, but in general, the same parameters that are modified in the liver are also modified in the heart. A similar picture we have in the brain. This is a neuron, and we show in this picture the main modifications that may occur when the rat becomes arthritic. Now, arthritis induces a series of modifications in the brain, as you can see, which are similar to those that occur in the liver and in the heart. But here we have also measured the transmembrane potential of the mitochondria, which is increased. A fact that certainly contributes to the increased production of <clears throat> reactive oxygen species, which lead to lipid peroxidation, protein oxidation, modifications in the levels, in the level of GSH, which is a decrease in this case, and modifications in the nitric oxide concentration. The mechanisms, the basic mechanisms are always the same. There is an increase also in xanthine oxidase, which is very pronounced in the brain and which is a parameter that can be measured when you are investigating the effects of natural compounds on the oxidative status of these rats. Well, these are the main changes that occur and that can be explored when you are measuring the effects of natural compounds. We have done this with a series of natural products, purified or not. Several, we have done this, we have investigated the action of several extracts. 
with generally convincing results. I am shown here, before I show some of our results, another picture about the liver, which shows modifications in metabolism. Arthritis modifies metabolism in several ways. As I already said, <clears throat> glycolysis is increased, gluconeogenesis is decreased, respiration is increased. This is generally coupled to an increase also in the oxidation of fatty acids as shown by this work that we have published more recently. The mechanism is always the same. By the way, adipose tissue is equally effective. We have not investigated adipose tissue, but it is equally effective. So you have an increase in the oxidation of fatty acids, which leads an increase in production of CO2, in consequence, you have an increase in the respiratory chain, which in the brain at least also reflects an increase in the mitochondrial membrane potential. Changes in the NHD, NAD ratios, and so on. These are also parameters that can be measured, and it would be highly interesting to know if natural antioxidants and anti-inflammatories really affect these metabolic parameters and not only oxidative stress indicators. Of course, there is an increase in reactive oxygen species and so on. But things are correlated. There is an intense cross-talking so it would be interesting to investigate metabolic parameters as, as well. Next, I will show you, <clears throat> I have not so much time, of course, I have wasted some part of my time in trying to present this speech because I am, I am an old fashioned man. So I would like to show you results that were obtained with two different agents. An extract, which is an extract of Ilex paraguayensis, which in English is normally called yerba mate, using this Spanish word in Portuguese, yerba mate, or other designations here in Portuguese and Spanish, which is an herb which is consumed in southern Brazil, in Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay in this way. These girls are drinking what is in fact a hot water aqueous extract of this herb. The herb is dried, still green, and it is used to prepare this beverage here. It is very rich in methyl xanthines, which is caffeine and theobromine, for example. It is highly stimulating, but it also has other effects. In our study, we used aqueous extract mimicking the way by which the herb is traditionally consumed. For example, for example, these are measurements in the plasma, the plasma parameters. I have selected some parameters. I'm not showing the entire world which has been published in Food and Function uh, two years ago. 
This work was done in collaboration with the Mountain Research Center, which determined the content in phenolic compounds of this of the extracts that we use. You see here, it is important to use more than one dose of the drug. It is important to control, to use appropriate controls, which is the normal rat, which was also treated with two doses of the extract. The arthritic rat presents increased plasma protein carbonates, which measures the lesion to proteins, which the parameter measures lesion to proteins. There is also an increase. Oh. Sim? Não faz mal. Estive a falar com a professora e por acaso estava a falar com ela porque tive outros problemas hoje de manhã. Ah. Uh... I'm so sorry. So, arthritic rats present increased myeloperoxidase levels, increased plasma, it decreases the thiol levels in the plasma, and decreases FRAP reactivity in the plasma, which is a measure, can be a measure of antioxidant capacity. As you can see, treatment attenuates these effects to, to some extent, sometimes more, sometimes less. The effects are not always that pronounced, but there is a clear effect, attenuating effect. This is an anti-inflammatory, an inflammatory indicator. This is a oxidative stress indicator an oxidative stress indicator, and also an oxidative stress indicator. The effects are different. The extents are different. This cannot be predicted from in vitro experiments. Similar results were obtained when the liver was investigated, as you can see here. Protein carbonyls are increased in the liver as well as in the brain. Draws levels are increased in the liver as well in the brain. And treatment with the extract decreases these levels. It does not really normalize these levels, but this certainly depends in and apparently increasing the dose will not increase the effect, but there is an effect a decreasing effect, normalizing tendency when rats, arthritic rats are treated with these extracts. GSH, glutathione, reduced glutathione, is not really much increased than normal rats are treated with the extract but they are decreased by arthritis. And there is a partial recovery, as you can see. But the effect is much more pronounced in the GSH, GSSG ratio, which is actually a reduction ratio and which is much more important. This occurs in both liver and brain. So what I want to con conclude, I want to conclude about this few results that I show to you, that you can indeed, in the arthritic rat, measure and detect antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects, which are predicted by in vitro measurements, but the in vitro measurements are not able to predict the extent and the doses that are required to produce these effects. And there are also other parameters that are not affected. They should be affected, but they in fact are not affected. I have not enough space to show all these results, but 
I can assure you many programs are simply not affected in spite of the intense antioxidant activity of the extract. Ideally, ideally to finish, to finish, ideally one should always use purified compounds. In the case of the Gerbamati Elix paraguayensis, there are no purified compounds available or most of them are not available. Chlorogenic acids, you can generally cannot get great amounts of, the, of these compounds. But there are other compounds that are available, readily commercially available, as for example, resveratrol, which as you all know, is quite abundant in grapes, for example, and in many other fruits or products of plant origin. Well, resveratrol is a panacea. Many effects have been attributed to it. What interests us is the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. And we have proposed recently, have done recently a work in which we have changed our mode of doing experiments with natural products. Instead of using a single dose or two different doses, a low dose and a high dose, we have used various doses, several doses. We have done a multiple dose investigation for several reasons. Multiple dose investigation, although the uh, committees, the ethic committees do not like because you must use many rats, many animals for your study. I think it is important because it can bring to light many different effects and particularities of, action, of the actions of various compounds. This work, which was recently published, shows that resveratrol inhibits, in fact, the production of reactive oxygen species, concentration dependent manner in isolated mitochondria. These mitochondria were isolated from the brain. But these are isolated mitochondria, so that all factors have been eliminated, all factors that might be increased production of reactive oxygen species in vivo have been eliminated, even so. This is important, in my opinion, to investigate the action of natural products in isolated mitochondria because, because because you may be surprised and we have but since we have been surprised in several ways, in several occasions, because sometimes the compound may act as a pro-oxidant, in fact, and not as an as a antioxidant. Well, here are some results that I have picked to demonstrate the action of multiple doses of resveratrol, a clear concentration-dependent effect on the myeloperoxidase activity in plasma. As you can see, in arthritic rats, it decreases the activity. No effect or no clear effect in control rats, but resveratrol was not able to modify the diminished plasma albumin concentration. And the effect in in control rats is a mess, difficult to interpret, but there was a decrease in the increase in xanthine oxidase activity. 
But here again, the effect in control rats was a mess. No defined effect, a declining tendency here, but this is difficult to interpret. A almost normalization of the effects of the negative effects of alfredis in catalase. Dose dependent, dose dependent, of course. And I would like to emphasize before I end my presentation, the effects on plasma thiol concentration, which is illustrative of the reason why we should do multiple dose experiments. As you can see, arthritic rats present low concentrations of plasma thiols. <clears throat> this is consistent with oxidative stress. And this, this is mainly due to the low levels of albumin, of plasma albumin, as plasma albumin is the source of most IR reduced IR groups. Well, the various doses of resveratrol had no effect on the thiol group concentration in plasma. On the opposite, in the opposite, they had an increasing effect on the plasma thiol content in healthy rats. This is antioxidant effect. The plasma Albumin concentration was not changing, but its ability to have antioxidant effect has increased when resveratrol was given in a concentration dependent manner, but there is a maximum here and a decline afterwards. So actually, this shows that resveratrol has two kinds of effects antioxidant effect at low doses. And later on, a pro-oxidant effect. This appears quite clearly in healthy rats, but nothing happened in arthritic rats. But here, another factor appears, another factor intervenes. In arthritic animals and patients, there are higher levels of glyoxal and methyl glyoxal. These compounds tend to promote resveratrol induced oxidation, even at low doses. So actually, the interaction of resveratrol with glyoxal and methyl glyoxal is actually, actually impairs the possible antioxidant effect of resveratrol on, album, on plasma album. In conclude, you can conclude that all these things can in fact not be predicted by in vitro experiments, actually not even in cell systems. You have, you have to use animals, unfortunately to discover or to, to see experimentally all these different effects. So let me conclude. So in our experience, the adjuvant induced arthritic rat is a appropriate and convenient model for investigating anti-inflammatory antioxidant effects. Advantages are similarity of the human disease, a fair number of parameters can be measured, several and important organs are affected, high reproducibility, low oxidant actions can eventually be detected. For the future, multiple dose experiments are recommendable for increasing both significance and validity. Effects on the metabolic parameters changed by inflammation and arthritis may produce new insights into the mechanisms underlying the disease. Thank you for your attention. I sorry for my lack of
trained in this kind of presentation. At Thank the beginning. You so much. At the beginning. <laughs> it happens. It happens all the time. <laughs> So thank you, Professor Adelar. Um, I don't know, uh, I guess our audience is very shy and uh, they are not uh, questioned so much. Thanks, um, God. <laughs> no. But thank you for your uh, interesting and clear presentation. Uh, and thank you for meeting the allocated time, uh, even with those uh, problems at the beginning. Um, Okay, I think we are not receiving anything. Uh, so I, I just have um, one or two curiosities. They are not questions. Um, uh, we saw uh, in your presentation, of course, and uh, we know that you tested uh, not only um, Yerba Mate uh, or Resveratrol, um, so when you tested uh, some of the natural compounds uh, that you choose, um, did you test them, uh, all of them in their uh, free form, like this aqueous extract, uh, or did you isolate some compounds, um, or you have only results for steel beans, like resveratrol? Uh, you tested mostly uh, extracts in their free form? To now, most of our works, our studies have been done with extracts, but always characterized in terms of their contents. Ah, okay. Characterization, as I, I don't know if I mentioned it, it's mm -hmm. generally done at the Mountain Research yeah. Center. <laughs> so, uh, it's a collaboration that we have with this uh, highly productive group. But we have also done several uh, studies with isolated compounds. I gave you this example mm -hmm. with Veratrol, and I have, we have several other studies in which we use the purified compounds. Okay. Uh, so, the, trend, uh, the trend, of course, is to use purified compounds yeah. so you can really know what <laughs> compound exactly is doing what. Yeah. This is very, very important, I think. Uh, but sometimes it is difficult to obtain the main products that exist in extra. Yeah, of course. So uh, gathering uh, all the data obtained uh, in your work uh, regarding uh, the natural compounds that have uh, shown promising effects in this inflammatory process inherent uh, to the rheumatoid arthritis disease, um, you cannot establish uh, yet a, a relationship between the obtained results and, uh, for example, uh, the, the, pre the, the compounds present in these extracts and uh, uh, infer about the most promising classes of compounds, right? We don't have yes. those answers. Yes, you have a group of compounds, yeah. but you can say you have idea? certainly of what course. exactly the compound is responsible yeah. for what as I emphasize. Okay, okay, uh, of course. You can translate the doses. You can translate the doses. Look at uh, Elix paraguayensis, which is, there is a lot of consumption. There are people that drink uh, these infusions all the, during the whole day, mm -hmm. during the whole day. Uh, so they consume a lot of these compounds. You can make translations because they are formulas to the human case, to the human situation, I mean. You can make translations using certain formulas, of course. But it would be highly desirable if all these compounds were available in pure form. But you need uh, sufficient amounts. You need sufficient amounts because in vivo experiments consume much more much greater amounts of specific drugs. In vitro, you have very, very small volumes and you can test at will. You can repeat tests and so on. This is, an, is a disadvantage of uh, in vivo experiments. Of course. But you can use very small animals. Instead of rat, you can also use mice. 
which are much smaller and require much smaller doses. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess uh, the participants uh, have hungry, they want to have lunch. <laughs> so um, I think uh, I will end uh, the morning session uh, that had as a team a theme the application of natural products uh, in the health area. I thank all the speakers uh, who presented us with their communications. And I also uh, thank the entire audience for having accompanied us and for your participation. Uh, any question or doubt, uh, contact us uh, through the links available on the Congress website, email and uh, social networks. Um, before I leave, uh, I have just one message for André, Salgado, André, Folgado, sorry, André Folgado, one of our speakers in this morning speech session. Uh, since there were problems during your presentation, André, uh, we were um, unable to, ve your, to view your slides. Uh, so if you want, you can make your presentation uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the last piece, uh, pitch session, okay? Uh, you can contact us uh, for any further information. So, uh, Thank you, Professor Aguilar. Thank you, all the, the speakers uh, in this morning session. Um, so uh, I declare uh, the session closed. Uh, we restart at 2.30 p.m. Uh, with a session of natural products applied to the food sector. Have a good lunch, everyone. See you in the afternoon at 2.30, okay? Bye-bye.